Christopher Media. Let's make some noise. MGM presents the first motion picture of the 23rd century, Logan's Run. Just imagine the fulfillment of every fantasy. Run, Logan. The absolute attainment of every wish. Run, Logan! There's just one catch. Run, Logan! Logan's Run, rated VG, parental guidance, released by United Artists. Logan's Run. It's the perfect world of total pleasure. There's just one catch. Welcome to the future. You're experiencing the projection booth. I'm your host, Mike Five. Joining me is Mr. Rob St. Seven. 25 or 624? With us this week is our friend from the Cinephiles podcast, Mr. Eric Six. I actually live in Sanctuary, and it's filled with hipsters. Oh, fuck. Is it called Williamsburg? Well, it's Bushwick. This week we're talking about Logan's Run, the 1976 film which painted a rather bleak picture of the future where people were sentenced to death when they turned 30 in a spectacular ceremony known as Carousel. Those who didn't want to die at such a young age try to escape from the lone domed city where humanity takes refuge. These folks are known as runners. Run, runner! And it's up to the police class of sand men to exterminate the runners with extreme prejudice. Logan's run tells the tale of one Sandman, Logan 5, and how he's used by the unseen powers that be to find those runners who have escaped the dome so they can be destroyed. Whew. Eric, as our guest, when was the first time you saw Logan's run and what did you think? I believe the first time I saw Logan's run, I was sort of in middle school, which was a few years after, actually many years after it first came out. When it first was released, I remember seeing the ads on TV and thinking, yeah, this looks cool. And I remember having, uh, do you guys remember those like photo novels they used to put out whenever a movie would come out? Oh, yeah. They were kind of like comic books, but with stills from the movies. And I had the Logan's Run version of that. And I remember thinking, believing I had seen the movie because I had that. And I didn't see it until like I was in middle school. And I remember thinking, ah, this is, this is really interesting. Unfortunately, I saw it after I had seen things like Blade Runner and Star Wars and even uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. So I, I was very amused by its sort of quaint approach to futuristic principles. Quaint is definitely a good word to use for it. I think I saw it when I was in my teens, but only in bits, because rewatching it, there were like huge sections of it that I didn't remember. So it wasn't one that really stuck out at me as a kid. And uh, watching it now, I agree with Eric. It is very quaint. It almost feels like a movie that should have been made 10 to 20 years before. Uh, it has this, uh, at least to me, this kind of 1950s to mid-60s sci-fi feel. And that has a lot to do with the acting and uh, the design a little bit. I don't remember the first time I saw Logan's Run. It feels like it was kind of always with me. It feels like this might have been another WKBD Detroit kind of a movie. It felt like I had seen this many, many times. I really didn't begin to appreciate it until, I don't know, my mid-20s or something. And I guess it appeals to me in that kind of kitschy, quaint factor. But also, I just I kind of like some of the ideas that are going on with it. I like some of the ideas in the book a little bit more than they are in the movie. And it's interesting that they changed what they changed from one to the other was kind of interesting to me. The whole idea of uh, death at 30 versus death at 21 and just the political implications of some of that stuff, especially this being written in the late 60s during, you know, when Vietnam was really kind of heating up and was um, really, I guess it was kind of at the, the height of conflict. And just that whole idea of youth culture versus non-youth culture, the old men who are running things, and would the world be better off without it? Yeah, so I've watched this movie I don't know how many times, and it's funny, Rob, I also forget big swaths of this movie just because I think sometimes there's uh, parts where I'm like, oh yeah, I just kind of skip past this in my mind when <laughs> thinking about it but uh overall i still really enjoy the film and i find it to be um light fair but it could have heavier implications i suppose i think the most interesting thing about the movie for me is how it's, it's something that totally goes over your head when you're a kid but when you watch rewatch this revisit it as an adult 
it, it presents a very sexually progressive society. The thing that I like the most about Logan's Run, I think, is just that it has a very well-defined world. You know, it's all in this kind of shopping mall world filmed down in Texas, I believe, in Dallas, all in this uh, shopping mall that hadn't really kind of started business. And the whole world is there, and you get to see a lot of aspects of it. You get to see from birth to death and some of the stages in between, you know, you see the, the nursery, you see carousel, you see how these people are spending their time. And a lot of it is this whole permissive progressive kind of idea of let's take drugs and have sex. Yeah. I guess when you're in a world where you don't have to have a daily job, maybe (laughs) that's what you end up doing. Well, a lot of that to me, is Brave New World. So that's that's Huxley in the 30s. You know, I mean that's the the whole babies are all created in a in bottles and incubators. Uh, no one has children in a, you know, in the way traditionally uh, nature had deemed was the way to do it. And the whole sort of uh, sexual liberation and also the drugs. That that all like I said, there's there's a lot of correlation in here between this this story and this society and uh, what Huxley writes in, in Brave New World. Centuries ago, in primitive times, before the dawn of civilization, there were things that would be inconceivable to us today. Such things as poverty, disease, violence, ambition, hate, and love. I definitely get a lot of that, especially when showing the nursery. I'm really reminded of that opening of A Brave New World and the whole idea of the education, the state being responsible for education more than parents. It kind of reminds me of The Giver a little bit, too. The whole idea of the the different stages of childhood and when parents are introduced, if they're introduced at all. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see how some of these things get presented. I like the idea of the whole idea of the um, the different stages of your life, you know, being represented by the palm flower that you have, you know, from this age to this age, it's one color, and then you move on up, and it's it kind of mirrors a lot of our current things where it's like, okay, especially, I don't know if I've rallied about this before, but this whole stupid idea of people celebrating graduations from kindergarten and, <laughs> and junior high and stuff, and it's like, what are you doing? Why are you celebrating this? It's like, you're going from one grade to another one. You can celebrate when you graduate high school, maybe when you graduate college, But fuck this graduation of grade to grade kind of stuff, especially kindergarten. You know nothing when you leave kindergarten. It's not like you should be proud of that. But shouldn't everyone get a trophy for participating, Mike? Here's your green ribbon. But that's the thing that's not explained in the movie. I'm guessing that in this society, and people are like 30 years and younger, it's a sexually progressive society. There's no explanation as to whether or not there is any kind of form of birth control or whether or not they are actually giving birth to the new generation of people that eventually hit the carousel once they hit 30 or whether or not they're they're genetically created a la, you know, test tube baby types or anything like that. Because clearly the this, this statement of this society, it, it's, it's kind of we need to control the population, right, before it gets out of control. So this is why we're killing people at 30 years old. So if that's the case, why are they sustaining it in the first place? This is where the divergence from something like Brave New World is, is, or or even a 1984 kind of you know dystopia utopia future, is there is no face that runs everything. That was one of the things I was really taken by when I watched the movie. Is that it almost seems like the system's been set up, and the people go along with the system because this is the way it's always been, and no one really wants to question it. And when you question it, then they send the people after you to kill you. And I thought that was kind of a a fascinating idea instead of saying, well, it's this one guy who runs everything. He's like the dictator and um, we're rebelling against the dictator when instead it's more about rebelling against this system that's been created and this um, sort of self-perpetuating system out of, I guess, a sense of uh, legacy, loyalty, that's tradition, the way things are always done. It's kind of interesting to think about how such a society would be set up and how it plays itself out. 
Well, there's the insinuation that the whole thing's run by computers. So we know what's going on outside of that dome. It's an apocalyptic tale, basically, post-apocalyptic society. <laughs> but somehow somebody put in place a system via computers to maintain this particular society. Yeah, I just always expected that. And especially when I looked at the credits, and it says Peter Ustinov is the old man who we meet later. I was thinking that maybe he was the old man in charge, kind of the, you know, I'm the the wizard, the man behind the curtain kind of thing. I'm the man who makes everything go. I'm the one who wants this society in this way. And, and that's not the case. It seems that at some point, as you said, it was cranked up, fed into a computer. The algorithm runs everything, which sounds more and more like our modern world. But I, I was just always waiting for that reveal that there was going to be, you know, they, they get into that computer room or they get into some place and then it's, you know, this sort of star chamber that runs everything. You know, it's like five old guys or something. I'm kind of glad that they don't necessarily have that. And I think that it, it's a little bit more sinister that we don't have the faces. You know, it's it's really a letdown for me when it comes to The Matrix when we see the architect. You know, we see George Carlin in the little room kind of thing. It's like, I I don't need that. I, I yeah. prefer that you have this faceless thing. I, I guess I see what you mean as far as like having – like a face to Big Brother, and you have a face to kind of the god that Robert Duvall speaks to in THX 1138. And that's kind of cool, but we just have the voice when it comes to the master computer that's talking to Logan, this very gentle woman's voice who's more of like this mother figure who is just as sinister, if not more, than these male figures that we have in this other stuff. But I think, Eric, you were going to talk about the Logan's Run TV show and that we do kind of get into that. Yeah, they do present a council of elder people. They are kind of like overseeing everything in a TV series, and they're sort of presented as sort of the bad guys kind of thing. I was also going to say that I think I think Brave New World is a great comparison. There's something about Logan's Run for some reason that also reminds me of H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, the future that's presented in that with the Eloy, you know, like these young kind of like naive people that just exist. There's always something there for them to feed on. They're always having fun, you know, all that stuff. And it's like the computers in uh, Logan's Run are the Morlocks, right? That they're controlling all this and they're providing whatever these these uh, people need to to be provided with to survive and all that stuff. And it, it kind of reminds me of that also the sort of the costume choices remind me of the costumes of the Eloy in the in the film version of the Time Machine that starred Rod Taylor. Yeah, it's kind of weird that the villains of the film are I guess you could say the Sandmen themselves are kind of the villains, and really you get a lot more in some of the other media that Logan's kind of a dick. When this movie starts off, he should be really dicky because you know you see him kill a runner, you see that he has no regard for human life, he's doing his job, but you really kind of find out almost to me too early that he doesn't necessarily abide by the party line, and I think that it would have done a little bit better had they paced it out so that you don't necessarily know where Logan's coming from. And again, this could be one of these things where I've seen the movie so many times where I know where Logan ends up, so it's easier to see him as that nice guy at the beginning, but really he should be a little bit more vicious to me because... Logan is very dogmatic or should be very dogmatic. And this whole idea of him changing and seeing the value of life and falling in love with one person, which really is kind of frowned upon in society is this whole idea of pairing off that change should be a little bit more gradual and just um, have a little bit more weight to it. Well, I mean, consider this, and I'm going to get into my, you know, social critique again, and I'm sure we'll get uh, hate mail com, you know, comments on this because you know I wanted to listen to a show about Logan's Run, not some sort of communist lecture over here. But <laughs> you know, I the the movie came out in the mid '70s, right after the end of Vietnam. So you could almost see an allegory to someone like Logan as maybe like a Ron Kovac. Where he was, you know, this guy who went over to Vietnam, he was bought in to the system to to go fight. And then he comes back and tries to take down all of the things that he originally stood for, 
So you can almost see Logan as a stand-in for many of the protesting soldiers who came back after the war, that they were in the system, they agreed with the system, they signed up, they went, they fought, they killed, they did what they did, and then they came back and said, this system, there's something really wrong because I've been inside of it and I've seen how it works. I ain't gonna be part of this system, man! So it's it's kind of an interesting uh, thing to play that in the background in your head when you're watching this thing. I think that's an interesting take on it. Uh, However, he's undercover. He's been sent by the computer to do this thing to find Sanctuary. So he's doing that out of loyalty. And on top of that, he has to be convinced by the rebel cause, the underground, whatever, that what's going on there is bad. That's another thing. To your point, Mike, about whether or not he should be more vicious or whatever, he doesn't see himself as killing runners, if I recall. There's that scene where he's with Jenny Agutter where he meets her for the first time and she accuses him of, like, killing. I felt sad. I put myself on the circuit. It was a mistake. Sad? What do you feel sad about? A friend of mine went on carousel. Now he's gone. Yes, well, I'm, I'm sure he was renewed. He was killed, like the others. Killed? Why do you why do you use that word? Isn't that what you do? Kill? I've never killed anyone in my life. Sandman terminate runners. So in his mind, he thinks he's actually just providing a service that would have been provided anyway through the means of the carousel. We don't get that explained enough for me sometimes because the whole thing is supposed to be you attend carousel, you go up to the heavens, you explode or whatever. It's kind of an, uh, a strange scene. And then really it's supposed to be this whole idea of renewal, of rebirth, of reincarnation. And they don't necessarily get into that as much as they might. They maybe should do some sort of thing. I mean, because they have these numbered names and everything, which you would think like, okay, Logan five will be replaced by Logan six and Logan five. Maybe he renewed into Logan six, these kind of things, but I don't necessarily get that. They believe it as much as maybe they should. I don't see the, the zealotry of the belief in this as maybe as much as I would like. And I would like to have uh, Jessica talk about how renewal is a sham and that, you know, nobody's, she's never seen anyone renewed. She's never been able to see this kind of connection between one generation and the next, but I don't necessarily get that either. But that's one of those things where Logan is supposed to be an ardent believer in all things that the system has presented. So the termination of the runners, the idea of the renewal, all this kind of stuff should be him born and bred. This is what he believes. And the idea that of him changing his belief should be a much more radical process. You try like hell for renewal. Otherwise, when, when this turns to black, that's it. But if for some strange reason you want to be 31, then, then you have the same chance as everyone else. Like your friend tonight. Carousel. But if you're one of the misfits, that's where I come in. Well, he has that one scene with the guy in the hot tub where he talks to him about, have you ever seen anyone renewed? And he's like, what are you talking about? Whatever, just get in the hot tub and (laughs) tries to get him off it. So I I do agree with you that if the society was a bit more zealous and stronger than I think the ending would be even stronger um, than it is, because then you could feel that he is rebelling against the system and all of these things have been uh, sort of laid out before you to go, okay, there's a lot of... um, hardcore believers in this uh, in, entire process. So when the ending comes, it really is an emancipation in a stronger way. Well, come on. Get in the water. Francis, did you... Did you ever see anybody renew? <laughs> I think you've been sculling out too much. First nursery and now silly questions. No, but did you? Did I what? See anybody renew? Of course. Anybody we know? Look, get into the water. You need it more than I do. 
you don't get any sense that okay, yes, you have the people who have accepted this is society I lived in. There's this thing called a carousel. We must we must be uh, renewed when we hit thirty. They don't think of it as death. And then you have like the underground people, the rebel underground, so to speak. But you don't get any sense of of whether or not the society allows some dissension. Just just you know, just so that so that whoever runs things can say, oh no, we let people indulge in a little bit of freedom of speech now and then, kind of thing. And I think I think the film would have been a lot more interesting. And we're talking about a film that was made in 1976. But I think the film would have been a lot more interesting if, say, they had little people that were allowed to indulge in their own separate philosophies under the illusion that they have the freedom to do this, but they're really being controlled. This is coming out in 76, kind of going back to what you were talking about, Rob, with this whole idea of tearing down what the establishment is. I mean, late 60s into the early 70s, you had that whole idea of... Don't trust anyone over 30! That they set the age limit as 30, I think, is very telling when it comes to this. And really, it is supposed to be this kind of... I don't want to say it's not a fetishization of youth, but it's much more of a rejection of the old ideas. And I think something that comes out maybe in the book a little bit more, and maybe it should be in the movie a little bit more, is this idea of would the things that are happening in the society still happen if you had the wisdom of the ages? If you had older people, could they help navigate out of this rut that the society is could they be the ones who say we need to change this kind of thing because it really isn't that bad or you know hey let's send people outside and you know explore the the wilderness enough because it makes sense to have this youth oriented culture to kill people off to control the number of people that we have while the world is a terrible place because we have to assume that at one point there was some sort of catastrophe outside nuclear war or whatever and the dome was the only safe place but you know now maybe we can explore past that and send people out but do they not do that because they're young and foolish i mean there's an interesting thing you can look at this film you know, two different ways as far as the rejection of the aged, as far as representing old and bad ideas, the kind of people that got us into this mess, or you can look at the aged as somebody, as people who are older and wiser, who have lived these many years and who could possibly move past where they're at right now. And when you bring Ustinov's character into it, and I know we're jumping way ahead when it comes to the actual layout of the film, but when you bring Ustinov's character into it, he's kind of a nincompoop. So I think that that might say something as far as what we can think about our elders. I know it was intentional. To me, it seemed unintentionally funny that they want to make a big deal to everyone else. Look, you can grow old and stupid like this guy. He's just not that bright. And once he's kind of childlike when it comes to seeing their palm flowers and wanting one of those himself. And, you know, what, what can we trade for it? It feels like a kid on the playground with his bag of marbles and he wants to switch out an Aggie for a steely or something. It's like, yeah, this guy maybe should have, I mean, he's, he's been around the library of Congress all of his life. Maybe he would know what that stuff meant. Yeah. It's, it's weird. He has that. There's a reference to some skeletons, that are, you know, in the room that he's in, he says, oh, yeah, they used to be my friends. And then and they just stopped talking. They fell asleep. And they never woke up kind of thing. And he is and he's very childlike. It, it, the question I have, the Dome City, how long has it existed? OK, you like like Logan is Logan five or is it Logan six? I'm, I'm spacing on it right now. I think it's Logan five, but it's Logan three in the book or something like that. OK, so clearly there were four previous Logans, four previous generations of Logan. So right there, you can guess that was at four times 30. OK, so it, how many years has this thing existed? Peter Ustinov is, is we're supposed to think he's like in his 80s, I guess, 70s or 80s. Is he was he there when the apocalypse happened or was he born in, into the aftermath? And how long ago was that? before he was alive. So there's a lot of stuff there that that I'm curious about because it ties back into with your initial questions, Mike, about, well, how, when when does it finally get to the point where people get curious enough where they all want to send out sort of reconnaissance teams to find out what's going on outside? Or can they simply not do that because the system's put in place to prevent them from doing it? Or 
are they like the Eloy and H. E. Wells' The Time Machine, where they become so used to this that they've just got grown complacent? Seems like there's a lot of complacency, and then they have their own system in place with the Sandman to keep any sort of stragglers under control. That's how it seems to me, anyway. To me, it just seems that it's sedate because people go along with the system. They've just all come to accept that these are the way things are done, so we continue to do them that way. And that's how it goes. So, which I don't really think is that far from the truth. I mean, when you look at contemporary culture, like, why do people do certain things? Well, because my parents did that, and my grandparents did that, and it's tradition. So, the idea that if they could establish some sort of, you know, methodology for life and make it somewhat within... um, the needs of what people need, at least on the, uh, I guess, the animal side, as you were saying there, the, the the drugs and sex thing, then you can sort of keep everyone in line pretty simply. Because ultimately, they're just a bunch of kids. They should be easier to mold and they should be easier to control. So maybe that's maybe that's another sort of subtext to the society is that as you get older, you get more knowledge and then you start questioning things and then that causes dissension and and you know rebellion so therefore we don't want to deal with that so we'll just you know raise these kids literally from embryos and make them do exactly what we want it seems like in this kind of society it wouldn't be too far of a stretch like we don't really see any sort of a worker class to this and we don't necessarily see how they get their sustenance or anything it seems like this kind of a society would be easily the kind of society that would be eating itself. You know, it feels like they would be the kind of people that would snack on some Soylent Green as they went along. I mean, it just feels like these folks are so complacent that they don't question how things are the way they are. Who maintains the machines? Who manages, you know, who fixes the Sandman guns, these kind of things. It just feels like they are content to just live their lives as part of the basically their cogs in the greater machine and that's the thing when i watched it i go this belongs to that category of what i would call like clean science fiction clean utopia stories where in the future everything's sparkly and clean and very bright it's a lot of white doesn't seem to be any trash around so i wonder how that's getting picked up it, it's just kind of amazing you know in that way. So I that's why for me I can't really take it as as a realistic story. It's more of a fantasy allegory in some way about how these utopian societies that we've seen in various sci-fi films or books um there's always the darkness underneath that is concealed by that candy-coated shell. I love that some of the things that are in this movie seem to kind of be out there today, like the the whole idea of Logan coming home from a hard day's work, putting on a Sandman robe, which I love. I wish I had one of those. And just kind of booting up his little machine there and seeing who's on the circuit. And being able to pick from people who put themselves on the circuit to be able to have a little liaison with them. It feels very like... Um, chat roulette to me <laughs> where it's like okay let's see who else has their cam on tonight and let let's uh, go into a room and, and find out what we can find out so it feels like there's certain things where it's like oh okay i can you know maybe one of these days when we get our teleportation system set up a little bit better because i love how you know as we all know the first use of most technology is how can we you know do pornography or or sex with it so they definitely have that technology going Going on in the future, which I was like, okay, that works. And even when it comes to Francis coming in later on, and you know, he's got he's pulling a Fredo, he's got two cocktail waitresses with him, and he's just like, okay, let's throw up these drugs here and let's let's do it, you know. And it's just um, again, it feels like um, very true to life when it comes to this stuff. It's like chat roulette fused with Wonka vision. You call somebody up, comes up on the screen, it steps right out. As long as Mike TV doesn't step out, I'll be okay. Look at me, everybody. I'm the first person in the world to be sent by television. I do like that Logan kind of gets a glimpse of how cold the system can be when he goes in and presents the Ankh, the symbol of life. He's taken off of one of the runners, and he puts that down in front of the computer. That kind of sets off this whole thing where the computer wants him to go undercover and 
try to eliminate the runners from Sanctuary. He cannot fathom that over a thousand people have run and are unaccounted for. So when the computer like puts him there and ages him, takes away four of his years, and he sees just exactly the power that the computer has, I think that's the first chink in his one of the first chinks in the armor that conversation you were talking about as far as have you seen anybody renew so we have those little glimpses of him as this character and all of these little things add up and we do get to see the way that he changes and it's uh nice that jenny agutter shows up as jessica six her character i think is even more interesting than logan's character though i guess she's not necessarily as dynamic because she knows what she wants. She wants sanctuary, even though she's not nearly old enough to really think about running. You know, she still has what, four years? No, more than that left on her life clock. And Logan has his four years, but once he gets that taken away, I, you know, it really puts a panic in him as it should. Which is odd, right? I mean, I understand that they want to put him undercover and all that stuff and make it seem realistic. But why did they have to rob him of his four years? Why didn't they just say, okay, dude, now you're going to pretend you're 30. We'll just say that you faked your years and we'll do something to your little diamond thing on your hand and make it act, you know, do its thing where it says, oh, no, I'm 30 years old. Why do they actually have to take off four years from his life? If they wanted to, I suppose they could make it green or yellow or any color that they wanted to. But by making it black, all of a sudden he's now, or flash red black, he's right there at the end of his life, even though he is still the same age, but it's all about that life clock. So whatever that says, society's going to go with. I'm sure that over the years, there have probably been people that have had faulty life clocks installed, and maybe they got killed when they were you know, 20 or 8 or 6. As long as the life clock says it's time to go, that's probably where these folks are you know, going to send you. They'll probably send you right to carousel as soon as that goes. Buttle tuttle. There's a lot of stuff that happens before they finally make it to the outside world. We get to see, again, I was talking about the world building. We get to see these kind of substrata. There are people that don't necessarily hold to the the main society. There are these younger kids called cubs that are kind of rebellious, though there's that whole line about... I feel sorry for you, boy. For me? <laughs> you better feel sorry for yourself, Sandman. No, 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 I... I feel sorry for you, Billy. How old are you? Forty? Fifty? The time is running out here. How long have you got left here? A year? Six months? What happens when you're 16 and you go to green? Nothing will happen. Nothing. I make the rules here. No cubs over 15, Billy. Oh, have you ever seen a cub who's, who's turned to green? You'll have to leave Cathedral then, Billy, because they won't let you stay here. And if you do try and stay here, Billy, your your young friends here will rip your guts apart. The cubs are kids, and once you reach a certain age, you basically are not allowed to be a cub anymore. But they do kind of have this subsect of youth gone wild, and apparently they are okay indulging it because the Sandmen aren't there cleaning out these you know cub dens. Uh, all the time and getting rid of these kids, these kind of wild children who always remind me of that group of kids that they find on Star Trek on that one planet where they're all uh, te- telepathic and they, uh, you know, sing little Ring Around the Rosie song, that kind of stuff. I don't know if anybody remembers what I'm talking about. No. Kids, when they have the dirty faces and they're hanging out where they shouldn't be, they scare the bejesus out of me. So I don't really want to know cubs. Dickensian and street urchins? Yes, very much like that. Character security. Post a guard on the children. They're to be kept under constant watch. Oh, do you want to talk about cast? Like the the fact that Richard Johnson was not originally supposed to play that part. He came in the last minute because the original actor decided to do a Hitchcock film instead, and that was William Devane. It sounds like almost everybody they had a different character for, a different actor in mind for before they ended up with this cast. Like, wasn't it uh, John Voight as Logan at first? And I can't remember who Jessica was, but yeah, it seems like everybody was somebody else at one point. 
I just can't imagine when Defane as as uh, Francis. That'd be really weird. I think he does a great job, though, Richard Jordan. I, oh, he's, he's fantastic. Ins- well, he did. He actually did a lot of TV. He actually did a lot of films in the seventies. He he the guy died of brain cancer, so he's no longer with yeah. us. But he he did a lot of like he was amazing in the Friends of Eddie Coyle. Um, he did two films with with Mitchum actually. I think he was also in the Yakuza. Is, am I am I right about that? But he was a terrible Dirk Pitt and raised a Titanic. Which should have killed his career, but somehow it didn't. But he did a lot of television. He replaced Edward Woodward briefly at the, in The Equalizer. He was a great Duncan Idaho in Dune. He had a really fulfilling career. I think wasn't his last film, The Hunt for Red October? I could be wrong. No, Gettysburg, I think, was his last film. And it's interesting to me that three of our main characters, even though this movie is basically essentially set right outside of Washington, D.C., three of our main characters have British accents. So we've got <laughs> Jenny Agutter. Michael York and Peter Ustinov all sporting the British accent. So I don't know if that speaks to a future. Oh, really? Where... I thought Ustinov was trying to do an American accent. I don't know. I can never not hear his British accent, even when he's trying to be Hercule Poirot. Yeah, everyone kind of speaks in that sort of clipped, almost Shakespearean American kind of way, with the exception of the actors who have English accents. I, I just think it's interesting that they didn't. You wonder if they had a conversation with Agutter or or York and asked them, could you guys try an American accent so we can make this all seem consistent? Because you got like Farrah Fawcett in this movie. She obviously doesn't sound British, right? So I I wonder how that discussion went or they're like, oh, we don't care. Their names. Just let them do whatever. It's the future. People sound however they want to. (laughs) Don't try to hold me back, man. I'm going to die when I'm 30, goddammit. I can speak however I want to speak. I always felt that, um, at least in American film, that having someone with a British accent lends this sort of uh, gravitas. Like, we're more willing to believe them and accept them with this British accents. You know, because if you had a character who was just, you know, regular old American, you'd be like, oh, whatever. But you can give Brits um, bad dialogue and uh, we'll eat it up with a spoon in this country, it appears. Or they're villains. If it's a predominantly American cast and you have a British person or two in there, they're usually actually, you know, Germans and uh, they're just speaking with British accents. Hans Gruber. The one part where Michael York's performance always makes me laugh, though, is when they come back from visiting the outside world. They've brought Peter Ustinov kind of with them. Peter Ustinov was being the most annoying guy in the world, and I just keep thinking, like, (laughs) are they thinking maybe we shouldn't have brought him along with us? Because he's just muttering to himself the entire time. So they go back in the dome, and they see Carousel again, and it's time to, like, kind of pull back that curtain that Rob was talking about and just say, you know, hey, Carousel's wrong. You don't need to do this, this kind of stuff. Hey, listen, we've been outside. But Michael York, when he starts doing that voice and he's like, you don't have to die. You don't have to die. Well, no one has to die at 30. You can live. Live. Live and grow old. I've seen it. She did it. Carousel's a lie. He was casting a lot of stuff in that period. Everyone was trying to make Michael York the next big thing. But it's just so funny when you see him in some like, like he, he did a few like adventure movies in that period. And he just doesn't quite make it as an action lead. He was, he was never convincing to me in that way. No, and it's funny though, because I like the guy and I like when he shows up and stuff, but he's not action hero guy so they come back as you said they bring peter usinoff's character with him and um he can't get in because there's no like way to get into the dome city so they have to like swim through this reservoir and into i guess the sewer system or something is that how they get inside the building through a series of tubes much like the internet yeah much like the internet and uh then they you know everyone's going into carousel and as you said michael york you don't have to die you know and all that stuff (laughs) and uh eventually they bring the all the kids outside and they meet the old man and they're like, who is this? Oh, you're jumping ahead just a little bit because this is the best ending because the way they get to escape is 
the computer takes Michael York and starts questioning him, doing a debrief about what he saw in his mission. And the information is so upsetting to the computer that the computer explodes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I forgot about the exploding computer. <laughs> Which but, is always one of my favorite things. Does not compute. Does not compute. It's like the Star Trek end. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so they bring them all outside. They get to meet the old man, and they're like, hey, what's up with that beard and all that? And they start, you know, he becomes kind of this rock star uh, guy. I I just found it really fascinating that this has been entrenched, like you were saying, uh, Eric. It's like, how long has this society been around? So at least think, okay, it had to at least have been around two to three generations, right, in order to get pretty stabilized to the point that people are accepting of this idea. So, the, so they get outside and they meet this guy. It's like, hey, everything's blowing up. Great. Okay. Uh, it, it just doesn't seem like anybody's upset at the fact that their entire society has just collapsed. Or they don't know. You see, that's the thing. They don't know that it's collapsed. Yeah. And you would think that at this age, they would have seen people with facial hair. But then again, there are no Sandman or any any man inside of the dome with facial hair. So that must be either removed or <laughs> it's really taboo <laughs> they get it removed at the new you shop well the other thing uh with this ending and i don't know if you guys got the read on this but the old man is dressed kind of in robes and he's got this staff with him to my mind he kind of looks like this image that i have in my head of moses so i got this idea that okay well Moses has come to free the slaves from the, you know, evil pharaoh that's the computer system, <laughs> you know, and I was just like, is that what they were going for? Some sort of Moses allegory here in the end? I could totally see that, especially, you know, because he's going to literally that. lead them through the wilderness, hopefully not for 40 years. But but that's the, that's going back to what I said before. It's a stupid old man. <laughs> you know, it's 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 look. This is our future. Isn't this awesome? Old and stupid. Well, you know, it's and I don't see how he's going to help lead them through. I mean, Michael York and Jenny Gutter, those two characters, they seem to have a better grasp of how to navigate, you know, the jungle of the outside world much better than this guy did, who was in a freaking library congress and probably didn't read a single book. So it'd be interesting. I, I you just I, those I would cats. love was, Yeah, it's like like out there there's this like imaginary sequel where what happened afterwards, you know? People, you know, didn't get the food they were being provided with. They started to get sick and tired of each other. They were like this old man's an idiot, let's just push him off a ledge, you know. It, it would be interesting to see where that would go. I know there were like sequels to the novels. I have no idea where those went, but those went to outer space. It's like Machete Kills. They took us to Mars which is where Sanctuary was. They managed to get up to a station that's orbiting Mars, I should say. And uh, they hang out there for a while. And then there's, again, I think they get into that whole Council of Elders thing again when it comes to either the second or third book. It's been years since I've um, read them. But, uh, yeah, I want to say there's a Council of Elders. There's even, a, a like, the third one, I want to say, is almost like a do-over of the first book where Logan gets to revisit the events of the first book, so it's kind of like a lazy book a little bit. It kind of reminds me of like, uh, I don't know. I, I hear that this was supposed to be good, but I've never read Ender's Shadow just because it's a retelling of Ender's Game, but from another character's point of view. And it's like, come on, that's just like rewriting your own work. So <laughs> why, why don't you do a, a little something different? Take the story into a different direction than just giving us the same story, but from a different perspective. How do they well, get into space exactly? What's the conceit behind that? I don't remember, but you would think that it would take a lot to get into outer space. Yeah. But, you know, it doesn't take a lot to get from outer space to the Earth, as gravity pointed out to us. So it should be, you know, fairly easy to get from outer space to wherever you want to go. Going back to this Moses point, never forget that Moses was given the 15 commandments. The Lord, the Lord Jehovah, has given unto you these 15. Oi. Ten, ten commandments for all to obey. So he was kind of an idiot. So this is a consistent analogy. 
Got it. All right, let's go ahead and take a break, and we'll play back a pair of interviews. One with Logan's Run co-writer William F. Nolan, and the second with the other co-writer, George Clayton Johnson. For you, the listeners of the Projection Booth podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day free trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. You can download Logan's Search by William F. Nolan or another book of your choice for free by trying audible.com and it's yours to keep even if you cancel your subscription to download your free audiobook today go to audibletrial.com forward slash projection booth again that's audibletrial.com forward slash projection booth for your free audiobook let me ask you a question are you getting enough I bet you'd love more right? Well, AdamandEve.com wants to give you more with 10 free gifts. First, you'll get a sexy surprise for her. Second, a specially selected toy for him. And third, a little something we know you'll both enjoy. Plus, you'll get six full-length adult movies on DVD. And number 10, free shipping on your entire order. So what do you have to do to get your 10 free gifts? It's not hard. Just go to adamandeve.com and select any one item. It could be an adventurous new toy, sexy piece of lingerie, or anything you desire. Just enter offer code BOOTH at checkout, and you'll get all 10 free gifts. Go check out adamandeve.com today. Select one item and get 10 free gifts including free shipping when you enter offer code BOOTH. That's B-O-O-T-H at adamandeve.com. We are the Popcorn Poops. My name is Dustin. And my name is Jessica. And together we produce Popcorn Poops, the best married couple movie commentary track podcast on the internet. Join us each week as we take turns picking films and then watch and discuss them together. If you're at home or with a computer or device, you can sync up the movie and watch it right along with us. However, you don't have to sync up the film to enjoy the show. Feel free to tune in like you would to any other podcast. Please visit us on the internet at www.popcornpoops.com. Again, that's www.popcornpoops.com. Hi, I'm Ben. And I'm Josh. And we're the hosts of the Devil's Advocates podcast. Each week, we discuss the most controversial topics and debate them in a civilized discourse. Subjects such as cultural and racial relations. Hey. Marlon is not scary. He's not scary to us because he's in a well-lit room in the middle of the day. Women's issues and the right to choose. I'm in the abortion clinic. I won. What's wrong with abortion? They're not going to know. The right to bear arms. The police get a different standard than we get. Because they have to fucking fight crime all day. The importance of love and family. He was fucking my mouth and it hit my gag (laughs) reflex. We've had guests on our show ranging from comedians like Jared Harris of Action Figure Therapy. What fucking rights have been taken away from me today? To adult film stars like AVN Performer of the Year, Aurora Snow. This is Aurora Snow and you're listening to The Devil's Advocate. Find the show online at wearethedevilsadvocates.com, my niggas. And for even more of their ignorant ass shit, go to their Facebook page at facebook.com slash wearethedevilsadvocates. Listen to The Devil's Advocates podcast today. It'll leave you more satisfied than I leave my wife intense, strong orgasms Mm -hmm. are the ones that I give to myself. (laughs) (laughs) Damn it! (laughs) The Escalaptor Mark III replaces traditional automated hairdressing and cosmetic devices with the latest in servo-surgical designs. Its multiple surgical laser beams are focused with microscopic accuracy to restructure your face and body any way you like. Imagine! A whole new face in less than an hour. Welcome to the 23rd century. The perfect world of total pleasure. MGM presents the Saul David production of Logan's Run. Run, Logan. Just imagine the fulfillment of every fantasy. Run, Logan. The satisfaction of every vanity. Run, Logan! The absolute attainment of every wish. Run! There's just one cat. Run, Logan! Logan's Run. Rated PG. Parental guidance suggested. Released by United Artists. Logan's Run. It's the 
perfect world of total pleasure. There's just one catch. Before you were an, an author and a screenwriter, I read that you worked for Hallmark. That's right. As, as, as an artist and, uh, and creator of Hallmark poetry, uh, I would do the artwork for the, for the card, and then I would do the little verse or whatever the card required, the little greetings and so forth. And so, yeah, I did. I did. That was in Kansas City at their, uh, at their main offices in Kansas City, Missouri. That's my hometown, so it was easy for me to, to work there because I lived right close to, to everything. I, I lived on Forest Avenue in Kansas City, and and uh, Hallmark was downtown. I could just take a streetcar down there and, and be there in 20 minutes. That seemed a natural thing. Yeah, I, I, enjoy, I didn't stay there a long time. I left them to, to register at the uh, Kansas City Art Institute. I wanted to develop my art ability a little bit more, and I felt that I was sort of in a dead end there at Hallmark. But, but I enjoyed what, I, what I, did, uh, I did do there. It was a lot of fun. Did you have a specialty when it came to greeting cards? No, no, that, that, that they don't have specialties. Well, what they do is they, they seat you down in a room with maybe 10 or 12 other people, and each one of you comes up with a card or two, and then you go into a conference room in the next morning, about 10 in the morning, and, and they run your, your notes up on a screen. They're all handwritten, so they, they run them up on a screen, and they all comment on it. What do you think of that verse? What do you think of that artwork? So that that's how it's done. It's, they don't really assign... Uh, Sympathy cards and birthday cards and you know uh, congratulations uh, graduation cards that that's all just just part of the of the you you can write any kind of card you want and then you can bring it into the meeting the next day and they'll they'll give it a critique so it's pretty loose pretty open or at least it was when I was there I don't I don't what it's like now so how did you uh, go from that to Hollywood well I was uh, I grew up in Kansas City Missouri I, I was born there and I stayed there for the for the first uh, 19 years of my life, and I I might have still be there were, were it not for my aunt Grace uh, in California. She uh, she had a lemon grove in Chula Vista, California, which is a uh, kind of a suburb of uh, San Diego, uh, near the border, near the near the Mexican border. My father uh, was invited by Aunt Grace, his sister. She was his sister to come to uh, San Diego uh, or the Chula Vista area, and take care of her lemon grow for us and you know she, instead of hiring a somebody to, to trim it and take care of it and put the pots out if it gets too cold at night and all that she wanted my she wanted her brother and my father to do it and so we jumped at the chance because i really wasn't happy in kansas city and I, I wasn't going anywhere i wanted to be an artist a commercial artist and there was no real chance there in kansas city and so my father flew out to chula vista and took over the lemon grove and then my mother and i drove out uh, in, a, in a 1936 Dodge, I remember, over Route 66. That was the only route that went from one part of the country to another back in uh, 1947 when we got out there. So that uh, that took me to California and started my career there. I'm looking at your CV, and it seems like in the early 60s, you just kind of exploded with stuff. I've had over 2,000 pieces of work printed, 90 books and 60 poems and uh, about 20 television and film scripts produced and uh, an awful awful lot of stuff it, it does not up but then you got to remember i've worked i've worked for 60 years every day writing only and, and when you write every day for 60 years you, a lot of stuff <laughs> a lot of stuff accumulates you don't have to be prolific it just happens you know people say oh you're so prolific and i say no i'm not prolific i think isaac asimov was prolific you know max brand was prolific uh uh john simenon was so john creasy all oh, those people did 500 600 books I said, I just plug along at about a book and a half a year, plus magazine work and so forth. And, and I did work 33 years in the industry doing television and film work, but uh, but that's another story. How did I get started? I got started by uh, falling in love with the work of Max Brand, the Western writer who wrote Dr. Kill there at Nestor Rides. Again, I fell in love with his work when somebody gave me a, a copy of uh, one of his Westerns for my 14th birthday. I immediately entered the world of Max Brand, who who had, has done 300 books altogether before he died. He died as a war correspondent in 1944 over at the boot of Italy in the Italian campaign. Anyway, my first piece of work was a published essay on the works of Max Brand in a book called Max Brand, the Man and His Work, uh, edited uh, out of Los Angeles. Los Angeles. So uh, I went from there to uh, making friends with Charles Beaumont, uh, who was just getting started himself as a writer, and Beaumont said, "You need a, you ought to, you ought to quit your job." I was working in the Department of Employment as a, um, a job counselor at that time, and he said, "You got to quit your job and write full time. You're a good writer." I said, "Oh my God, I can, I can never make a living at writing." And he said, "Look, here's what I'll do. 
If you quit your job and become a writer, I will give you my Rogue of Distinction every month. I get $250 a month from Rogue for writing a series of profiles of, of famous people called Rogues of Distinction. I'll just give you that. I'll just turn that over to you. You can write them, and, and they'll pay you the 250 And uh, can you live on 250 a month? And I, I said, sure. Back then, you could. You certainly couldn't now. So uh, so that, that got me started as a writer. I was able to quit my job and, and write for Rogue Magazine, and it just kind of blossomed out from there. Is that kind of how you got involved with some of the uh, biographies that you did, like on John Houston and Steve McQueen and that? Well, you know, I, I, I've done eight or nine biographies. I've done I've done a short one on Hemingway. I, I've done two of them on Dashiell Hammett. I've done McQueen. I, I've done uh, uh, Phil Hill, the first American world champion who, who, lives in, who lived in Santa Monica and, and became the first world champion overseas driving for Ferrari. Uh, I've done John Fitch, the only American that ever drove for Mercedes-Benz. And so uh, I just got interested in, in these lives. I mean, uh, the biographies resulted from my own interest in the lives of these. Barney Oldfield, the turn-of-the-century racing driver, that nobody ever has done a book on before or since. My book is the only one on him, and yet he's he's a major name like Eddie Rickenbacker in World War One. Uh, and yet no one did a book on him. So I would I would go to the library and I would say, I want a book on so-and-so. And they'd say, John Houston, for example. And they'd say, there's no book on Mr. Houston. Uh, there's some magazine. Art. I said, no, no, I'll write it myself. And they always thought I was crazy when I said that. I would constantly go in there and say, I want a book on Barney Oldfield. And they said, no, there's there's books on John Ford. I mean, Henry Ford, rather, but not on uh, on Barney. And I said, then I'll, then I'll write it myself. See, my father drove the first car over the Santa Fe Trail and chased Pancho Villa down on the border in 1916, and and he raced Barney Oldfield in, in uh, 1908. He, he raced Oldfield and actually beat him in one race. So uh, I, I come from a kind of an adventurous background, although I'm myself and not an adventurer at all, except in print. I mean, I am Logan, you know, N-O-L-A-N, L-O-G-A-N. It's even, even the names are, are the same. Uh, now, am I Logan in, in reality? Of course not, but in imagination I am. How did you get involved with The Intruder? That's easy to answer. The Intruder came about because Charles Beaumont wrote the novel based on John Casper, who was a rabble rouser back in the East that, that, that tried to create dissension among uh, schools, uh, the, the integration of schools. He got out there and tried to, to stop the integration of schools, uh, black kids in the white schools. And so Beaumont became interested in that story. He read it in Look Magazine, and he became interested and went he went back east to interview Casper and, and created John Kramer, uh, Adam Kramer, which sounds a lot like Casper, is the name of the character in, in The Intruder. He wrote the novel The Intruder, and then he shopped it around Hollywood to try to sell it, and everybody was afraid of the theme of uh, social integration, uh, school integration. So finally, uh, Roger uh, Corman took it up, and he said, let's, let's film it. Let's go, to, let's go to the boot of Missouri and film it right there where it would happen. And uh, and Beaumont came to me and said, "How'd you? How'd you?" I said, "You're a ham." He said, yeah, you, "You, yeah." I said, "I'm a ham." I said, "I've been acting most of my life in school plays and stuff like that." And he said, "Listen, why don't you come to Missouri with me? There's a pivotal role. There's a supporting role of Bart Curry in this movie that you'd be perfect for. Uh, you, you can you can talk the dialogue of the Missouri flat dialogue." I said, "Oh hell yes!" I said, "I grew up there. I know I know how those crackers talk." And he said, come on with me. And so that's I came with him along with some other friends of his, like Derek Slayton Johnson and and uh, and O.C. Rich. And we all went to Missouri and uh, filmed The Intruder in a couple of weeks. And and that's, that's that story. But if I hadn't been good friends with Chuck, I never would have been involved in it. You see, life is a series of contacts. Life is who you know. And uh, you don't you don't take advantage of your friends, but you use you use their influence and their suggestions to, to make your own life better. Uh, right now, it's it's Jason Brock, the man that you talked to before. You're talking to me now. He's he's my best friend now, and he's helped my career a lot by opening it up. So, that's that's I, my answer to most of your question it has to do with friends who open doors for me, and I walk through them. So, is it through Beaumont that you met George Clayton Johnson? I met George uh, when when we formed a group called uh, it was called a group, and uh, we never had a name for it in those days, and it it had. Uh, Charles Beaumont, Richard Matheson, Ray Bradbury is our mentor, Robert Block, Harlan Ellison. Uh, we had a lot of people, and about 25 people uh, would, would form around this uh, uh, the idea of writing. And we would all stay up all night in coffee shops talking about editorials and editors and, and the market and so forth. And one night there was a knock at the apartment door of Charles Beaumont's apartment door, 
in North Hollywood. I was I was there that night. I was in the apartment visiting Ch- Chuck and Helen, who became my my dearest friends. There's a knock on the door, and this guy walks in, and he's carrying a package, and he says, "I'm a writer, and I, I I've heard about your your group, and I, I'd like to be part of it." And I, well, who are you? Well, I'm George Lane Johnson. And I, I have, I have my, my credentials with me. And we said, well, what is that? And he said, I wrote the Ocean's Eleven for Frank Sinatra. And he said, here, here's my, uh, my writing. Here's my script. And so from that point forward, George was part of the group. He sort of introduced himself. I, I wasn't introduced to him by anyone else. He just walked into our lives. When you came to Logan's Run, was that a script first or a book first? Oh, well, the origin of Logan's Run is very simple. It started way back in 1962, which is uh, more uh, half a century ago now, uh, with a, again, uh, it deals with contacts and with people. I mean, I, that's, I keep going back to that. Charles Beaumont was teaching a class in science fiction at UCLA in Los Angeles. It was one of the few science fiction courses uh, at that time. Uh, this was 1962, as I said, and he he called me up and said, I'd like you to come and talk to my class. And I said, well, I don't have a lot to say. And he said, well, I tell you what, I, I'd love it if you could, if you could, uh, to show them the difference between social fiction and science fiction, could you, could you bring some example along or, or, or verbalize some example of that? And, and, and that will, that, it's a, it will make it a, a big difference to them if they can get it in their head that science fiction and social fiction are totally different. So I said, well, I don't have any ideas, but let me think about it. So on the on the freeway driving uh, home, and a couple of days later, I thought, what if what if we take the old idea of life begins at forty, which is a cliche, and 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 turn it around and say death begins at forty in a futuristic society. When you turn forty, uh, you're eliminated, uh, and and then and, and social fiction. When you turn forty, you run off with a Vegas showgirl. I said, there's they're, they're totally different. So I that's all I thought would ever amount to anything. And I, I made a little note about the idea and put it away. And I thought, well, I'll never do anything with it. And then I went over to George Johnson's, again, a contact, went over to George Johnson's house to, for dinner one night. And I said, George, I have this idea about a future society where you're not allowed to live past a certain age. Uh, and I told him about it. And he said, oh, my God, to make a great screenplay. I want to do a screenplay on it with you because George was into screenwriting with Twilight Zone and doing a lot of scripts at that time. And I had done very few at that time, and, and I said, well, yeah, that would be great. But I said, there's one thing. And he said, what's that? And I said, we need to do it as a novel first. It'll give us a double edge. We can sell it as a novel and a screenplay. He, he said, but I've never done a novel. I said, neither have I. Let's do one. So we, we, we rented a, a motel room uh, on, in Malibu uh, near the ocean, and uh, George would show up every morning, uh, and I would stay there during the night. I wasn't married then. And George would show up, and we'd sit down at the typewriter and spell each other at the typewriter. He'd write for a half hour or so, get up. I'd I'd take over and write. We'd plot it together. We talked about it. We made cards with little notes of the future society. And slowly, Logan's run emerged over a three-week period. Uh, we, we wrote the whole book in three weeks. And George says, what are we going to do with it? And I said, I'm going to take it up to San Francisco alone and rent a motel up there and go over the whole thing, tighten it up, you know, cut what needs to be cut. Then I'll bring it down to you, and you can go over and make any changes you think are necessary. So that's exactly what happened. I went up to San Francisco, uh, completely rewrote the thing, brought it back. George made his addition. And uh, and then we said something very strange. People don't quite believe that this is true, but it is true. We said, this is going to be a major motion picture. I know it is. It's got everything that a picture needs, I said. But we're not going to sell it cheap. We're we're going to demand $100,000 up front. Uh, for the for the movie rights to Logan's Run, and everybody said, "Oh, you're crazy! I haven't even sold it to anybody." Hundred thousand dollars—that was equivalent to about a million dollars back then. This, we're talking 1960s now, 65, 66. And uh, we said, "No, nope, we want a hundred thousand, or we're not going to sell it." And so, to make a long story short, we got an offer of forty thousand, and we turned it down. We got it. We got a sixty thousand dollar offer. We turned it down. We kept. And finally, MGM said, "All right, okay, I, we'll we'll pay you a hundred thousand. George Tal wants to produce it, so we'll pay you a hundred thousand. So that's that's how Logan's run started. Tal dropped out after a while. Uh, we brought in other people. They dropped out. Uh, Irwin Allen wanted to do it as, as after the uh, Poseidon Adventure. He wanted to do Logan's run. He had a lot of artwork made up and so forth, and that fell through. And I thought, well, they're never going to make it. And then suddenly, uh, Saul David, the producer, got together with the heads of MGM and said, I have an idea how to do this." And they accepted his idea, and Logan's Run happened as a movie. But again, we're we're dealing with contacts. It's who you know, and 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 how you can take advantage of 
of the opportunity that you get by knowing certain people who maybe are a little bit farther on the up, up the trail ahead of you and, and can lead you forward. That's what Jason Brock is doing for me right now. So it all it all uh, it all ties together. It really does. So it's uh, what seven years kind of between when you guys wrote the screenplay in the book and then when it's uh, being turned into a movie. Why did they not go with your screenplay? Why did they bring in uh, Mr. Goodman to adapt it again? Well, uh, Goodman was a, a friend of the executive producer of the, of the movie, and he he he, uh, <laughs> he swam in the guy's pool and played tennis with him, and, and got got again. We're talking contacts. I keep going back to that word. He made a this David Zelly Goodman, who wrote the screenplay, made a big contact with the executive. Uh, at MGM, I didn't know the executives at MGM. I was I knew Saul David or I, because he'd been a, a book editor at Bantam Books, and I sold him some stuff years earlier. But I didn't know anybody at MGM. And this David Zalek Goodman had had an in. He knew these people. So when it came to the time for the script to be written, George and I wrote a script which we both liked a lot. I, I still think to this day it's a very good screenplay. But immediately they threw it out and they said, No, no, we we want a, a little different approach. And we've got David Zalek Goodman ready to to write for us. And so he uh, he ended up getting the credit of writing the movie. Uh, it had a lot of things from the book in it, but it, it was not the book. It's particularly the ending with the old man and everything. It's totally made up by uh, by you know uh, Zelly Goodman and other people. It had nothing to do with the book. So I'm 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 semi pleased with the movie. I think the first half is pretty good, and then it, it disintegrates pretty badly when they when they get the old Washington and meet Peter Ustinov, which is <laughs> totally not in the book, and and everything changes and it gets pretty boring. Every, all the action stops and uh, it, it just kind of disintegrates in front of you. But up to that point, it's not a bad little movie. Uh, but I, I credit uh, I, I, I credit the fact that Chuck got me to write this thing for the class, which resulted in a, in a novel, which resulted in a movie, and, and then and finally in a TV series. They actually made a TV series out of it. So these things just accelerate like a snowball going downhill, you know. Which kind of came first, the TV series or, or the second Logan book? The second Logan book is called Logan's World. I wrote that as a screen treatment for MGM. Who said they wanted to do a sequel? They they wanted to uh, film a sequel to Logan's Run, and what did I have in mind? And I wrote a sixty-page treatment called Logan's World, which they liked a lot, and they were all set to do it. And then CBS comes through with a nine million dollar offer for television rights, and that MGM was struggling at the time. They were in bankruptcy, and they were about ready to fold. Logan's Run literally saved the studio. I mean, I'm not I'm not exaggerating when I say this. The success of the movie, it was a $9 million movie, which made $25 million gross plus overseas. So it, it saved MGM's ass. And when MGM got a chance to make another $9 million out of television, they immediately scrapped the idea of doing Logan's World and went for a television series, which was a big mistake because they got a cast that didn't work. Uh, Heather Menzies and, uh, and the rest of the cast were just, they were miscast. It didn't work. I, I, I wrote the pilot. They threw the pilot out and got other people to write the pilot, which was terrible. So uh, those those kind of things you just have to ride with it. That, that's just part of Hollywood, you know. You, if if you get if you're soft or sensitive in Hollywood, you you can never make it. You got to shrug your shoulders and say, well, that's the way it went, and then move on. That, that's why I was. That's why I lasted 33 years there. I was able to be adaptable. You have to be very adaptable because all these things happen, and and you can't take it personally. You just have to move on. I never really got to write Logan to run for the screen at all, even though I did the pilot for the TV series. I I never really got uh, got to, to put my stamp on it at all. It's been a little while since I've uh, read Logan's World. Was was that more of a sequel to the movie or to the book? After after Logan's World was rejected as a as a film outline, I, I decided to turn it into a novel, and uh, I picked up. Sort of loosely, at the end of the MGM, all of the people come out of the ruined city, and I, I, I then I called them the wilderness people. They began to live out beyond the cities. I didn't have domes in in Logan's Run. They were mile high cities, not domes. But I took part of the ending of the movie and moved that toward Logan's World, and then I did Logan's Search, of course, the third book in the series, and based that pretty much on Logan's World. But what I did is I took the the people who left the city and turned them into the wilderness people which lived outside the city, and uh, and I didn't refer to the city as domes or some mile high. I just, I just let the one bleed into the other, as it were, because MGM did an entirely different approach, and I had to sort of match that in a way and yet still retain my own ideas of what of what Logan's world should be like. So that was a tricky thing, but I, I think it worked pretty well. So Logan isn't your only reoccurring character. You also have the Sam Space series. Can you tell me a little about that? 
Oh, yeah. Well, Sam's face is uh, my zany side. Theodore Sturgeon, the writer, said that, that Nolan has a zany side, and, and, and he said he can get pretty wild, and, and I do. Uh, I decided to, that, I, that I love science fiction, and I love the hard-boiled mystery. I've done two books on Dashiell Hammett, and I've done the writing on Raymond Chandler, and I've done a lot of hard-boiled fiction myself. Created my own character, Bart Chalice, a L.A. detective back in the 60s, and wrote some books about him. Uh, and then one day I said to myself, well, it would really be fun to take science fiction and uh, in the hard-boiled school, the Dashiell Hammett multi Salkin school, and put them together and see if I couldn't do some kind of wild idea of a private detective, a very tough private detective working out of Bubble City on Mars with three-headed clients and robot dragons and all kinds of stuff. And just let my imagination just go wild and just whatever comes up, go with it. And so I did that. I wrote Space for Hire, and Lancer Books in New York bought it. And uh, and they said, gee, we just love this. Could you do more? So I, so I did a sequel, Look Out for Space, which was published by another publishing company later on, many years later. And then I, uh, I did a lot of short stories. I finally ended up with a collection called Seven for Space, which has five short stories and two novels about Sam Space. So, yeah, Sam Space is not nearly as famous as Logan, but uh, I have a lot of fun. And that's, that's the zany side of my life. Logan is the serious side, and, and Sam Space is the zany one. So after Logan's search, you you took a little while off with that character, but then since then, you've kind of experimented or taken him into different media, like the ebook and then the comics and everything. Where have you taken Logan, and what have these new media kind of offered to you? Well, there's a, there's a um, a man named uh, Paul McComas. He's a, he's a writer. He lives in Chicago in the Chicago area. He grew up with Logan's Run. He he had uniforms and guns, and he played Logan's Run games when he was a kid and all. And one day he said to me, you know, it'd just be great if you and I could collaborate on on a Logan adventure. And and the more I thought about it, the better I liked it. And I said, well, I have some ideas. And I gave them to him. And he said, yeah, and I, th- I have some ideas. And we, we exchanged ideas. The next thing I know, we're writing a book called Logan's Journey, which which is now with my agent in New York being submitted around. I don't know who's going to buy it. Somebody will buy it. Uh, it's a full-length novel called Logan's Journey by the two of us, myself and Paul McComas. Because George Johnson and I just went different directions, and I don't really work with George anymore. He's still my friend, but we don't we don't write together anymore. So that that's out there. The comic book thing came about through contacts again because uh, Jason brought new the editor of Blue Water Comics, who was moving into Van- into the Vancouver area where we all live, and uh, he was looking for projects. and And Jason said, "Well, you know, Bill Nolan has Logan's Run. That's the uh, uh, it's been done with the comics before, but not for years. Uh, Malibu Graphics did one, and Marvel did one. Uh, they did two series of them, but they, but they all both ended, and I had the rights back. And Blue Water said, oh, we'd love to do Logan's Run. So as a result, they've done something like 20 issues so far. They're bringing a big omnibus uh, a single edition of it out uh, this summer, which will have uh, about 20 different magazines combined into one giant book. Uh, that'll be yeah, so. Uh, yeah, I like to keep Logan alive through different venues. Uh, there's a Logan's Run uh, rock band. Uh, there's a Logan's Run limousine service. There's Logan Logan's Run motels. Uh, Logan Run conventions. Uh, there've been Logan Run fanzines and and Logan Run fan clubs. So Logan has become part of our national culture. Uh, everybody knows the name Logan's Run, even if they've never read the book or seen the movie. When you say Logan's Run, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, because uh, it was re-telecast several times uh, on, on the net, and people are familiar with it. So that's something that I'm proud of. And as I said at the beginning of our conversation, I'm not a bit bored or sorry to be associated with it because it's, it's my most successful work. I've done 90 books, uh, and Logan's Run is by far the most successful of them, although I just won a stoker. At the World Convention this year, at the, at the World Horror Convention in, in Portland, I won a uh, Bram Stoker Award for my latest nonfiction book called Nolan on Bradbury, essays about Ray Bradbury that I wrote through the years. So I, I keep my hand in on, on a lot of different uh, different areas. I, I've worked in, uh, uh, in 12 different genres, from aviation to sports to uh, straight writing, uh, uh, horror, science fiction, fantasy, uh, Hard boils, uh, biography, uh, poetry. I've done 50 poems. I, I have my a book. My collected poetry is is on in the press right now. It'll be an ebook, uh, and that'll have 50 of my poems in one one book. So I I like to keep busy. I like to keep going new directions. In fact, today, just this morning, I, I'm working on on a brand new short story that's going to be really wild. Uh, where this guy down on the storm brings under L.A. meets this creature uh, that is looking to uh, to be impregnated, and he wants to be a father. So 
they get together and produce this giant egg, and out of the egg comes this tentacle horror, this sort of Lovecraftian creature. So I'm working on that right now. I, I love writing, and I get up every day excited about what I'm going to be doing next. Do you still keep up on your artwork? Yes, I do. Uh, every time I write a letter to somebody, I I, I do a, a cartoon in the, in the in the first page of the letter with their name on it, like, hi, Danny, or hi, John, or hi, whatever. And then I do a big cartoon head, a big smiling head. That's about all. I don't do painting anymore. I've done any watercolors or oil for years. Uh, although I still have a portfolio of stuff in the garage of, of my early writing. I uh, I was a, I was an artist uh, for uh, uh, in in San Diego on Balboa Park. I had an art studio there. If the, if the young artists uh, had a, a kind of a, an area where they had a, a different different uh, studios uh, grouped around a central plaza. And uh, they had showings, and I, I had a showing at the Fine Arts Gallery in San Diego and got, got a nice review on that. For years, I thought I was going to be an artist until I sat down one afternoon and wrote a, a story I thought might be fun for Playboy, and Playboy bought it for $500, and I said, wow, I'm in the wrong business. So I kind of switched from art to uh, writing, but yeah, art is still a hobby of mine, definitely, yeah. Do you know how did Last Day a Radio Dramatization come about? The dramatization, the radio, I don't even have a copy of that. They never even sent me one. I, I did sign the contract and got paid for it, but I've never heard it, and I don't have a copy of it. And in fact, I keep making a note to myself to write them and ask for a copy. Uh, that, that just came about because uh, the uh, the editor, the publisher at uh, Blue Water contacted these people, and and, uh, and he, he said, how would you like to do an audio on uh, of Logan's Run? And they said, great, and it, it happened. I really didn't have anything to do with it, actually. I signed the contract. That's about it. You sound so spry. How do you do it? What's your secret? Uh, yeah, I'm 86 years old, and, and people, uh, they don't believe I'm 86 because I'm, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic, and I... I, I just as Jason said to you, I talk a mile a minute and I get excited about everything. And if I'm not excited about something, I can't write about it. But luckily, I get excited about a lot of stuff. The way to do it is to uh, take care of your body, first of all, because you can't write if, you're, if your body fails you. I, I do a half hour in the gym every morning. I go in the gym and work out on the different machines every morning. I, I don't smoke. I never have smoked. I only drink a cup of coffee a day just for a stimulant. I don't. I, I used to drink a lot of coffee. I cut way back on that. I don't eat meat. I'm a vegetarian because meat has chemicals in it, and you're killing animals, and I don't approve of that. So what I'm doing is first I'm taking care of my body. If you take care of your body, your brain is going to be taken care of along with it because that's obviously part of your body. It's the it's the key to your your actions, and you keep a a sharp brain. There's no reason I can't be writing at the age of a hundred. I mean, I'm I'm 86 and I I've got plenty writing ahead of me and I don't intend to stop. So people say, God, you're so energetic, and I say, No, I'm I'm just excited. I get excited about things, and and that keeps me young. So if there's any secret to it, that, that's it. You had written the the Norlis tapes, and yeah. I was curious about that because it that one and the Night Stalker really had kind of a, a similar vibe, and they were written around the same time. One got picked up and the other one didn't. Do you think that there was just not room enough for two kind of horror detective shows at the same time? Well, uh, okay. This is again we we go back to contact time. That's a single word when you when you when you print this thing or whatever you're going to do with it. You just you just hit this word. William F. Nolan talks about contacts because everything is contacts. This happened because I was over at Richard Matheson's house. Matheson being a very close friend of mine for years, I was over to his house. With, one one day, and he said, uh, "There's this guy, Dan Curtis, that uh, has his show, Dark Shadows, uh, uh, up in uh, New York. He's coming to California to stop his offices out in California, and he's looking for writers. He's looking for projects. I think I think you ought to go down and talk to him. And this guy's going to be a colossus." And so I went down. I met Dan Curtis, and, and he said, "Well, what do you want to do, Nolan? You want to go to work for me as a co-producer?" And I said, "No, I, I want to go to work for you as a writer. I'm a writer. That's what I want to do." And he said, well what, well, what do you want to write? And I said, I want to write this. And I threw this uh, this very brief synopsis, uh, synopsis of, of uh, the normal tape by uh, another writer. I forget his name even. It was really nothing that I used. Uh, none of my stuff appeared uh, in, as an end result in, in this thing. But it, it was a start. And I said, I want, I want to do a movie of the week on that. And he said, okay, all right, we'll try it. And the movie The Week turned out to be so well received by the network that they wanted to do it as a series, uh, a, a, a normal series. And it would have gone as a series. I even wrote a sequel to the uh, Norlis tapes, which never got produced, because they had a writer's strike. And the writer's strike went on for several months. And by the time it was over, the whole thing had cooled down, and they, they were moving in other directions at the network. And so the, the whole thing fell apart. But uh, but I'm proud of the Norlis tapes. I think it came out really well. I think Dan did a great job of directing it. 
And uh, that started my whole relationship with Dan Curtis. I ended up doing 15 or 20 different things with, with Dan over the years. So, uh, again, contacts paid off for me. Well, I agree. I really like the Norlis tapes, and I was I was kind of, you know, I thought it was a shame that there wasn't more of it. So, well, it was going to be a series, and there would have been a lot more of it if, if a writer's strike hadn't happened at the same time. So, you can't control stuff like that. It just happens, you know. Right. Well, hey, this has been a real treat talking to you. Thank you so much. Oh yeah. Well, I enjoy it. I'm I'm glad to do it. And if if I can help some young writer by listening to this and thinking I can do what Nolan did, then by all means, uh, uh, let them have a shot at it. Because the great thing about writing is you don't compete with anybody. You 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 have to, the only com- competitor I've got is William F. Nolan. I try to do better than that guy. But the rest of the world is they, they go on their way. And Stephen King writes with Stephen King, and uh, you know it. Uh, <laughs> And Dean Koontz writes as Dean Koontz, and William F. Nolan writes as William F. Nolan, and that's all you can do. I'm not competing with anybody. But uh, it's been fun talking to you, and I, I enjoyed the interview. It begins where imagination ends, in the perfect world of tomorrow. MGM presents the adventure of the century, three centuries from now, the Saul David production of Logan's Run. Welcome to a world of total pleasure. Run, Logan. Imagine the fulfillment of every fantasy. Run, Logan. The satisfaction of every vanity. Run, Logan. The absolute attainment of every wish. There's yours to experience. Run, Logan. There's just one catch. Run, Logan. The only thing you can't have in the 23rd century is your 30th birthday. Run, Logan. Logan is 29. Welcome to the 23rd century. Logan's Run, rated PG, parental guidance suggested, released by United Artists. Imagine the fulfillment of every fantasy. Logan's Run, it begins where imagination ends. It's a world of total pleasure. There's There's just just one one catch. You grew up in Wyoming. How did you go from Wyoming and being, uh, what, you started in telegraph operation? Yeah, I had a lot of different kinds of training as a kid worked in a lot of different kinds of professions. I spent most of my time as a young man shining people's shoes. I worked at shoe shine parlors in Wyoming or in cold places. They take good care of their feet. And uh, there's pretty good tips in the kick game. And, and it's an interesting environment. So I spent a lot of time in shoe shine parlors shining people's shoes. And uh, I guess from the time I was about 15 to... 1718, I was still doing that. How did you get into writing? I've always been a reader. That's what always, I think, gets everybody. I would go to the Salvation Army and get pulp magazines, they called them, about eight and a half by 11 kinds of things done on rough newspaper print or something. Anyway, they were called the pulps, and I was an avid reader. I'd pick up a pile of them everywhere I went, science fiction, Western detective. Did you have any particular favorite authors at the time? Or? Oh, yeah, I started picking them out immediately. A. E. Van Vogt got my memory, my imagination. Van Vogt wrote the Weapon Shots of this year, and it's the book, wonderful book called Slam. And he was quite of all the vogue. There were very few things you could get in public libraries, you know, that were science fiction. Six or eight or ten books would be there that you could track down. So uh, I spent a lot of time searching for science fiction stuff to read and buying pulp magazines from the Salvation Army for three for a dime or something and, uh, you know, developing a taste in that kind of fiction. So how did you make that leap from being a writer or reader to being a writer? I monkey see, monkey do, I guess. You know, truly it is. It's, it's an imitative art form. Like, I, you can detect a style in a writer. And if you're any good, you can copy that style. You can mimic it. You can forge it. And so I became a pretty good literary forger long before I ever really began to try to write anything. But I could pick up a tone of voice and do a couple of pages sounding like that, you know. I could read three or four pages in a book and write the fifth page. It wouldn't be like the one that the author wrote, but it would have his voice, his tone. And that's always been very important to me in the writing and in developing myself is the idea of uh, creating what telegraphers call a pist. You know, no matter how you tap this code out, the people can identify you. Oh, yeah, that's so-and-so. 
he always slurs his E's that way or something, you know. So I spent a lot of time reading and trying to copy styles. Like I thought Dashiell Hammett was really hot stuff in uh, detective fiction, you know, cops and robbers. And uh, if I were interested that much in that kind of fiction, I'd try to sound like Dashiell Hammett because he had the right voice. And that's been true of almost all of the science fiction writers. They have a, a voice, and you can copy it. You can make yourself sound like Isaac Asimov or Ray Bradbury or almost anybody with a distinctive take on the world. So did you start sending off stories to these pulp magazines, or how did you kind of get your first break? I couldn't imagine. I've had so many first breaks. No, it's really true. I've had a remarkable career of good luck meeting the right people or impressing the right people, I should say, so that later on I'd be recommended my name would come up in conversation. And a lot of it because I was really trying to be a stylist, trying to develop a voice that I could write in. And the second thing that I just was a lifelong devotee of uh, science fiction. And I had been reading those magazines since I was six and seven years old. I'd uh, pick up in barber shops or shoeshine parlors. And there'd be another stuff. You know, Zane Gray was a Western author who filled more damn magazines with prose. He was the Earl Stanley Gardner of Western writers, you know. How did you get involved with The Twilight Zone? Well, I've always been aware of that. The magazine of fantasy and science fiction is kind of an elegant literary take on your average amazing or fantastic stories. But this famous fantastic, you know, the magazine of science fantasy and science fiction, it's, I, I guess I'm what I'm trying to talk about is that it's really a continuum. If you know anything about one end of it, you know about the other end. Because uh, science fiction is a fairly new art form. I mean, a few people historically, like Jules Verne, did science fiction pieces or pieces that were, you know, scientific fiction, they called it at one time. And, uh, but it, about the 40s, it started to come into its own. The magazine started to develop, so that sold those, used those kinds of stories. And uh, along with some very powerful literary magazines like Argosy would feature a story by Ray Bradbury. I would pick out these authors and, and search them out and find out more about them. And, of course, wanted to be one. I wanted to be a science fiction writer. William F. Nolan and I wrote our novel, Logan's Run, under the influence of that childhood desire. How did you and Mr. Nolan meet? I became attracted, not knowledgeable, about a writer named Charles Beaumont. I wanted to get to know him better. I thought he was doing what I was trying to do. So I... Uh, found out where he lived, and I went to his house. He wasn't expecting me. He was busy at work with something with a friend. The friend was William F. Nolan. The book they were working on was The Omnibus of Speed, and somehow my intrusion worked for me so that I fell into conversation with him, and we got to know each other better, and I saw my purposes because I opened the doorway to a very fine friendship with Beaumont, and through him, Nolan, and uh, Nolan and I spent a lot of time together waiting for Charles to come out and play because he was usually assigned to something. Playboy had him on a monthly retainer and we wanted to, just about anything they could print of his. So uh, anyway, I got to know what we meant in those days. And as we came along through the years, we ended up, we shared a lot of common whatever it was that made us begin to see that, yeah, we really wanted to write a book, a Logan's Run, a, a man versus the technological society that we're all going to get a little bored with. And uh, he thought it was a good idea. So we began talking about it over coffee and coffee shops, making notes. And eventually, about six months after we decided to do it, we both got free enough of our assignments that we started to meet and write Logan's Run. But it was all because we were both very 
familiar with uh, everything that was published in science fiction, because in those days it was quite possible to do that. There weren't that many books in the library that had any science fictional take on them at all back in the early 40s. How did the the project kind of come to be? Was it a screenplay first or a novel first, or did they kind of come about at the same time, or how was that? It became a novel first. We ended up doing it that way. But it was agreed that if we wrote it as a screenplay, we tossed coins, we made some kind of a determination. I would get the first credit because I had had more experience and my name had more clout in that particular world. And uh, if, if we decided to do it as a novel, then Nolan's name would go first on the credits, which worked out that way. We decided to do it as a book and started meeting in a motel room in Malibu and with the two typewriters and a folding table. And, and we managed some... I typed, I sitting on the floor, typing on a stool, you know, as we would make notes and talk to each other, give each other assignments. Okay, you write the piece about Pittsburgh, and I'll write the piece about Las Vegas or whatever, and we do that. And then we pass it back and forth. Over a period of 20 days, we wrote the bulk of that book. Then when we went home and could, called it off, Bill took it off to San Francisco for another couple of weeks and sort of pulled it all together so that we ended up having a novel. So this was, what, 1967? You were coming off of, uh, you'd done the first Star Trek episode, correct? No, I didn't get around to that till later. And for some reason, no one never took off with television. But I ended up sort of making a living to what living I had, being able to make the house payments, get a hit on things, get an assignment. And both TV and, and magazines were the place to go. And the money was in TV. If you could get a TV assignment, you could get paid several thousand bucks. You could live for a while back then on that kind of money. So I put an awful lot of time into solving the problem of being a TV writer, just so I could have the time to do things like with Nolan and Logan's Run or other things that I've written through the years. Once Logan's Run was a, a book, then did you adapt it for the screen? We did several uh, drafts of, of scripts. We've got one script that we think is really marvelous, which is just a recreation of the novel with a couple of chunks left out. It's a very tight and uh, dramatic movie, but we could never get anybody to take it seriously. They were hiring people all around to write drafts of uh, Logan's Run for the screen. But for reasons I never could understand, the powers that be like to stay away from the original author. If they're hiring somebody to adapt something, they don't want the original author near it because he comes to things with a certain assuredness. Oh, no, I'm the man who made this story. Don't tell me what it's about. You know, that sort of thing. And uh, so they try to keep that guy out of the kitchen, get somebody else in there. And uh, so we never could uh, get close enough to show our wares to the powers that be. So you're able to sell your own television scripts, but when it came to actually selling the screenplay idea, they didn't want to have anything to do with you? I don't know. I really have no idea what motivated them, but I know that it's always really been a real problem for the original author of a book to get an assignment to write the screenplay. They maybe they figure it's just get added brain power at work if you use new people rather than the old people. But I think they always make a mistake when they do that. Because I had a early on developed a kind of a love for that whole concept, the idea of uh, they're going to tell you when to die one of these days. You won't be able to live a normal lifespan. You'll come up against a wall. Will it be 60? Will it be 40? Will it be 85? I'm 85 right now. But I'd hate to know that, no, they don't allow you to live beyond that. That's your share, so to speak. That would be terrible. I would be very frightened, and I don't know what I would do, because I would really like to keep my life. Don't want to be blotted out. So what can I tell you? The whole concept has always intrigued me. What will the government require? 
Right now, they'll, they've got rules about everything. They're going to have rules about how long you can live, how long you must hold a job. It's a con game of some kind. I've never been able to figure it all out, but I really try to go my own way, try to ignore the rules. So what was the reaction to the Logan's Run book? Yeah, it's been fantastic throughout the years. It was almost immediately taken and treated as a classic. You know, it's like this is a classic book of science fiction. Nobody has really written about mandatory death, you know, all that stuff. So that it came as a piece of new, what they called science fiction. I don't know that it's scientific or fictional, but it's just a cop story in the future. But it gives an opportunity to change a few things and to take advantage of the well-known chase and to be able to break it up into discrete chapters so we can to give each other assignments and talk to each other about the way it was going to go and anticipate what eventually ends up on a page that gets edited and re-edited a couple of times before it's finally submitted to an agent. But in our case, the agent, a lady, a woman, she thought immediately that it was very saleable, and she fired it off to five different literary houses, among them the Dial Press, which was a sort of an egghead kind of magazine and a or, or publishing house. And apparently we hit it right on the nail head because the editor who was at Dial was E.L. Doctorow, who became very famous as an author in his own right, but at the time he was functioning as an editor, and he liked Logan's Run, so helped us shape it for the Dial Press. And it finally came out with great fanfare. And it's received a lot of notice. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's socially possible. It's one of those things that you think about it a while, you begin to see where it might be very advantageous for government to stop people at a given age and get rid of a lot of this senility that's going on. So you were already over 30 when you wrote this book. You would have been, um, you would have had your life day yeah, quite we, a few years beforehand. Yeah, we had an argu- argument, a lot of them, about what would be the best age. Death at 40, no, that's life. It begins at 40. Death at 60, well, yeah, but because, you know, that might be feasible. But then I went to talk to a man named Edward Ibsch. Ed was one of the blacklisted Hollywood writers, but he was notorious for that era, and he lived in my neighborhood. So I was talking with him about this book that Bill and I were writing, plotting, and having meetings over. And he said, death at 21, the younger. um, I know it's preposterous. I said, life just begins then. But no, death, death at 21. And we started thinking about it. It's got a certain magical quality just to the the concept that the government's going to require that everybody die when they're on their 21st birthday because there would no dawn any old people in the world. It's a world of opening up and no dead hand of the past to keep dragging it back into the same patterns. And uh, we thought that all sounded sloganish, sounded good enough to almost win elections with. So we decided to write this thing at Death at 21 and uh, thought we might receive, you know, laughter, derision. But no, everybody who looked at it liked it. The agents liked it. And the first publisher liked it. So we just watched it slowly become a treasured novel. And before the, the movies ever heard of it, although Bill and I were trying at that time to shape up a script. We had meetings. We rented an office for the purpose of going there and sitting down together to see if we could come up with a script that we could sell to one of the studios after MGM bought the novel. We saw that eventually it would be a screenplay, a movie. And how could we get involved in that? Because, again, it's a case of they don't want to talk to us. We've made up the story. They, they want to get some capable screenwriter who doesn't have that attachment to what was done before. And uh, whether they're smart or dumb in doing that, I don't know. But that's 
That's a, almost a tradition that's done so often. So did you work with David Goodman at all on the script, or did they just kind of lock you out? Eventually, Bill and I got an opportunity to work on the novel, but we were doing it for ourselves. We rented an office and took the novel and started to think of it as a screenplay. And eventually we had a screenplay. And there were several people who were interested in the idea of a screenplay, but uh, it's as, writers are very expensive. We, but it limped its way from not existing to existing, finally getting filmed. It hasn't uh, lived its life yet. Logan's Run is, the definitive Logan's Run has not been made at all. And Bill's done, done several novelettes since that time, one called Logan's Search, one called Logan's World. And I've been working on a project I call Jessica's Run, which is a continuation, direct continuation of the Logan's Run book. And so one more day there'll be a resurgence of life and that old corpse and it'll leap to its feet again, go for the big screen, whatever it is at the time. But I, I see it still having another life to live. Yeah, I was curious about Jessica Saran. Can I? Can you tell me a little bit about it, or is that still all under wraps? Well, I've reshaped it several times, and I have about sixty or eighty pages on it, and it's a it's a continuation of the story because when when near the end of the book she gets separated from Logan and now is on her own, and the with the Sandman hot in pursuit. And so then it becomes Jessica's run. And she has a fairly interesting set of adventures in places like Punishment Park. And there's a whole bunch of new, what do you call it, uh, geography introduced in, in Jessica's run. And it's, uh, and it's in process of being shaped now. I haven't too much doubt that eventually it'll end up being made into a, a movie of some kind. This, without worrying about what's happened with Logan's run, this has got its own reality, Jessica's run. Tell me more about the Punishment Park thing, because I'm fam- familiar with a movie called that, but I, how are you using it? It's a place where people go, where if you want to kill somebody, you can go to Punishment Park. There'll be somebody prowling around trying to kill somebody, and you can kill him. No, it's no laws. Nothing applies in Punishment Park. If you want to let off steam and do something really, really dreadful. You know, you want to murder your wife, get her to go with you to Punishment Park. You know, you can walk out of there a free man. Nobody gives a damn. It's, that's the rule. And so I've, I've used that idea of a place where you can go and, and the laws don't apply anymore. How long have you been working on Jessica's Run? Since Logan's Run. Oh, wow. In one way or another. It, it slowly grows, you know, and... It finally it'll have enough chunks put together that I can publish it as a book if I have to. But I really am looking forward to somebody who would really like to do a wonderful chase picture in the future with the dreadful Sandman chasing you. You know, and all of the imagery from the book combined with a story about this intrepid woman who is known as Jessica. She's got a number attached to her name like Logan does because it's futuristic thing. But I've handled it so many times, I've become almost too familiar with the material. I've talked about it with others. I've pitched it to various people, saying, how about it? Leap aboard, we'll make a movie. So far, it hasn't happened, but it's come very close several times. Did you have anything to do with the Logan's Run TV series? No, I did not. We did. I wanted to be able to talk with him. Uh, Nolan and I both went and had a meeting with the producer, told him we were interested. But he really didn't want anything to do with us. Again, it's that don't bring the original author in because, you know, he's in a position to criticize everything you're doing, you know, because he, he made the whole damn thing up. Who are you to tell him what's what, you know, about that universe? So I think things kept keeping their distance from both Bill and myself. How has that felt, kind of seeing your character change over the years in television and, and movies and, and other novels and comic books? How do you feel as, as one of the, the original authors seeing Logan change over the years? Oh, it's inevitable, you know. And it's also just as Logan is probably 
had elements incorporated in it, stolen from other classic science fiction pieces. You know, so if old people steal from Logan and it'll just keep, keep getting mashed around. But the idea of uh, Flash Gordon, you know, it's the same as Logan, Logan 3, and why 3, I'm never quite sure, although numerology figures into it. What else have you been working on? A collection called, at the moment I think your three minutes are up, and it's got stories and old things in it, like a game of pool, which was a, a Twilight Zone, and Kick the Can, which was a Twilight Zone, and Nothing in the Dark, which was a Twilight Zone, and a new book called Your Three Minutes Are Up, and a whole flock of scripts and stories that will be in, put in, into the damn volume, and I'm sort of collecting a series of titles. I'll run through some. The Four of Us Are Dying, Execution, The Prime Mover, The Grandfather Clock, Kick the Can, A Game of Pool, Nothing in the Dark, A Penny for Your Thoughts, Eleven the Hard Way, The Demon God, The Man Trap, The Boy Who Said No, The Flame and the Pussycat. That's just a name, a few of the stories that I've done or written, some for TV, some for books, some for magazines. But it's a book that I'm putting together, which uh, has had its title changed a few times. But I think right now it's stuck at your three minutes are up. I have to tell you that A Penny for Your Thoughts is one of my favorite Twilight Zone episodes. <laughs> Mine too, I must confess. <laughs> well, hey, I think I'm good with questions unless there's anything else you think I should ask you. Well, probably I got could talk all day or say anything twice. Because it's <laughs> been a lot of talk reflecting back onto that period of my life. It's because that was very important to me, the idea that of all people, Rod Sterling, the man who'd won a whole flock of Emmy Awards for excellence in writing, has now chosen me to be one of the key people that is helping him make this series. And among them is Charles Beaumont and Richard Matheson, both of whom I considered intellectual giants in their way. And, and Rod is attracting those kind of people around him, and he's accepted me as part of that game. And, uh, of course, by that time, Rod Serling was a world-known guy, you know, for Requiem for I Have We Wait and a bunch of things that he had done for television. And uh, so, I don't know, I was just on, so honored to be part of the game. How did the story that you wrote kind of turn into Ocean's Eleven? Ocean's Eleven was originally written as a script, and it was called Ocean's Eleven. And here was this script. Four guys and me formed a company, rented offices, began to hold meetings in this offices to change this thing into something that could be sold to the movies. And we worked very hard on it and watched as it was being shaped and developed. And meanwhile, we had the script. Now, how, it, it, it starts to get a little fuzzy here because things the change in the world, like that Frank Sinatra thing. My God, now Frank Sinatra's involved in it. Now what will it, what will it do? And a lot of those ideas and things are fading away in memory. God, a lot of it is. 50, 60 years old, back when those events were taking place. I was a young man. We were trying to make a name for myself as a writer for television and movies. And I uh, had, had Ocean Eleven, but I had other things out there as well. And uh, many of them I'm sort of still working on. But, uh, like, I'm still a very much of a work in progress. Most of the best stuff I've written has never been made in the movies and TV. A lot of it has. And uh, just, it's those Twilight Zone scripts that I wrote are pr probably as shiny as anything that I've done since because I was really at a kind of a peak at that time when I was about 30. I think that's probably true for most people. Right around 30 is where they're most energy and the most ambition and most desperate need. And that's when the things sort of connect and now the life becomes orderly at, at about age 30. And that happens with an awful lot of people. I watch them. You know, they come out of the colleges, 
they found it a while, around for a while, and then they finally are at work and they're 30. back. Thanks to Mr. Johnson and Mr. Nolan for taking the time to talk to us. We have links over to where you can keep up with them on our website projection-booth.com. This week we're talking about Logan's Run and Mike I'm going to take a shot in the dark here and assume that you've read the books as you've already kind of talked about that the movie is based on. So uh, let's talk about the first book. Would that be the one that this movie is based on or is it a pretty radical uh, different vision from what we get in the novel to the screen? I'd say it's about half and half. I'd say that half of what you get in the book is what came to the screen. Uh, you get a lot of the character names. You get a lot of the ideas. You do have the character box that we see in the film and this whole idea of the different stages that they have to go through uh, as they're on their way to the outside world. The original screenplay was written in 67, 68 versus the, I believe it's Goodman um, screenplay from 76, where he took a lot of those elements and just kind of, you know, kept with them. But rather than making kind of a short journey between the Dome City and the old man, the, there is no old man in the uh, original book, the original screenplay, all that kind of stuff. It's it's a bigger world when it comes to the book. Rather than it being one dome city, you really get the feeling that there are cities everywhere. There's a whole transportation system that's taking you all over the place. And a lot of it takes place out at the Crazy Horse Monument out in South Dakota, which is kind of funny because I think that in the old Buck Rogers series, the television series that there was a lot of stuff that took place at the Mount Rushmore uh, facility, which was just like 16 miles away from there. So I guess maybe it was just kind of in the air at that time to put like secret government stuff in those monuments. Definitely differs. Like I said, they go up to Mars in the first one and everything has kind of become a little bit jumbled in my mind because over the last few weeks I've read the Logan's run screenplay, the original, the new one, plus I've listened to a uh, audio version of the whole thing, which was called Last Day, which kind of combines parts of the first book and the second book together and gives us a little bit more as far as there's a, a figure who has escaped from the dome called Ballard and what he represents to the people inside the dome to certain groups within the dome. It's kind of funny because there is what you guys were talking about, the idea of like a dissenting faction inside of the dome. And there are people that sing about Ballard and they're basically like, you know, kind of dirty hippies that are hanging around at the fringes of society, but they have a figure that they can say this person made it as opposed to the movie. You don't know if anybody's made it. And really one of the things I kind of like about the movie is that it feels like with the box character, maybe nobody has ever made it past him because he seems to be fairly unstoppable until Logan comes around. And it seems like everybody, those 1056 runners that have left the dome before have all been caught and frozen by box which i find to be a nice kind of really dark twist to it fish and plankton and sea greens and protein from the sea 
Fox, it was voiced by Roscoe Lee Brown, sort of the fake James Earl Jones. He'd had such amazing pipes, man. That guy was just amazing. And apparently he was actually in the box costume. I never would have thought that they would have put Roscoe Lee Brown in the costume. Oh, really? Until, he didn't just from- yeah. No, I was listening to the audio commentary. That's weird. They were swearing, swearing that he was in the box. That's interesting. I'm, I'm intrigued by this concept of this character, Sid Ballard, who sort of represents you know, the freedom they aspire to. I'm assuming that a twist happens later in a novel where you discover that Ballard isn't who they thought he was or they find a corpse that might have been Ballard's corpse. I'm, I'm running through all the possible outcomes. But do they do anything with that idea? Is there any payoff to that? I'll tell you an aftermath. It's really interesting. So this is the radio drama that kind of combines some of the things from Logan's run and I think it's Logan's world is the second one in that so it's logan and jessica out in the wild and francis is after them and there's some other sandmen that are after them as well it's not just francis and they meet ballard and he goes away for a little bit and francis kind of shows up and then he goes away for a little bit then ballard's back and eventually you find out that ballard and francis are the same person like it's that whole idea of like uh you know he pulls off his face and it's really ballard underneath and he's really old but he has a like i was talking about before he has a faulty life clock so his never turns uh, any other color than red and he just goes into the new you facility and will get a new face put on him every so many years so he's this old man that apparently can move in and out with no big deal but he primarily lives inside of the dome so it, that's an interesting twist to me and then in one of the screenplays i read it was ballard was francis's father and so there's all this kind of connection francis really becomes much more of an important character in other media than the logan's run movie but uh yeah it was, it was neat that he exists and that there's this whole plot that goes on with him yeah they do end up in one of the things they end up at washington dc but again we don't have that i guess ballard and the old man could be the same but really the old man that Peter Ustinov is playing is much different. He's not this kind of symbol, of course, to anyone that, you know, sanctuary exists. To me, when I was a, a younger person, when I was watching this film, anything outside of the dome to me is sanctuary, but apparently they still have an idea of what sanctuary is when it comes to this. And I know when it came to the television show, they just kept searching for sanctuary week to week to week. They're looking for sanctuary. And I'm like, you guys are outside of the dome. You're able to move around on your own. Yeah. Francis is still after you. You got a cool robot buddy that you're driving around with all the time (laughs) near little solar car. So I would consider that sanctuary, but apparently they were still looking for a very definite place when it came to that. Donald Moffat well, I mean, played the android, right? Yeah. Who was Gary in The Thing. Yeah, and uh, was the president in one of those uh, Tom Clancy movies. That's that's right. Yeah. How dare you come in here and lecture me? How dare you, sir? How dare you come into this office and bark at me like some little junkyard dog? I am the president of the United States. Now, there's a bit of irony right there. We talk about, like, what what's with all these, like, British actors using their British accents. Well, Donald Moffat was British. British. He is British. A lot of people know that. But he's he's played nothing but American parts uh, since he started his movie career. Prior to that, he was like a, a, a Shakespeare. He was a, a Royal Shakespeare actor and all that stuff. One of the things they really played up in both the book and the screenplay and in that Logan's Run Afterworld kind of thing was – the idea of their guns, the Sandman's guns became so central to so much of what they're talking about. There's this whole thing about how you can't pick up a gun if it if it's not coded to your life clock and all this stuff. It totally felt like Judge Dredd to me. This whole idea of, you know, you can't pick up a judge's gun or else it'll basically explode in your hand. And then what kind of made that even more of a fine point is this whole idea of having different types of bullets and they have six different bullets and they really go into detail of as far as what each bullet will do and when you should use them and all this kind of stuff. And it, I mean, the gun was 
really kind of fetishized when it came to the storytelling and it's like okay guys we don't really need to get into it like i like the idea like i was talking about with the world building and the the colors of the dresses and the the clothes that the people are wearing and life inside the dome and stuff but the the way that they just kept talking about these guns just seemed a little too much like they were really kind of like hey this is the future we're going to have all these different gu- these guns and bullets it even reminded me a little bit of uh, Runaway with the Tom Selleck movie where they had the different bullets, the heat-seeking bullets and stuff. And it's like, oh, God, you know, just enough with the gun. After a while, I just wanted to kind of yell that at the, the, the audio book I was listening to. The gun is good. The penis is evil. Stay away from the gun. I have nothing to say about that. The one thing, though, I did find when I was doing a lot of research on this is just how deep the fandom is of this film which is kind of crazy to me like when i grew up star wars was the thing 1977 i'm five years old i'm all into star wars you know you were talking eric that when you were growing up you had already seen so many of the classic sci-fi films especially the cutting edge special effects type films before you saw logan's run so you're kind of like Eh, yeah, you know, you can tell that the the city is a giant model with, you know, different tubes running around. The the city model always kind of reminds me of um, Gamera versus Giron and the the planet they're, that they're on with that one, especially traveling around in the little cars and stuff. So it's very you know, kaiju kind of stuff to me rather than cutting edge special effects. This movie apparently really affected a lot of people because this was such a complete world. We had all the spinoffs. We had the books. We had the comic books. You know, Marvel did a adaptation, plus they kind of went beyond that with some more comics. We had so many different things. And going back through, I was able to find just tons of old like zines that were dedicated to it, fan zines, where it's like people writing original stories, uh, fan fiction kind of stuff, people interviewing, you know, Michael Anderson Jr., the director's son who played the doctor, people talking to Michael York, and people people dissecting the outfits and the life clocks and the uh, the guns again and just like building up the Logan's Run world so much and of course the television series added a lot to that as well though i think when that originally aired they only aired a few episodes and they didn't air the entire run until years and years later on the sci-fi channel yeah but yeah it's there's just tons of huge Logan's Run fans that are just super rabid about this movie. Uh, I think it's uh, you brought up Michael Anderson, the director. Prior to that, he he directed the first film adaptation of 1984, which was like way back in the day, wasn't it? It was in the 50s, 1950s. Yeah. So, and the book came out in what 47, yeah. 48? Yeah, it was like the late. I think it was like the mid to late 50s when he did that. He also directed Around the World in 80 Days. So he's familiar with interesting science fiction. trajectory. Trying to look him up has been very difficult. I was really trying to see if he's still around. It seems like he's still alive, though he was born in 1920, so he would be 95 years old today. But if you try to look him up, all you do is find one of our former guests from the projection booth, Michael J. Anderson, the little man from another place who was on our Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me episode. You can't necessarily find... Michael Anderson, the director, who I believe also has a middle initial of J. So it's a little tough to find him out there in the world. Though he was directing all the way up till 1999, at least. I think one of the reasons why this movie was so popular amongst so many people, well, I think there's a couple reasons. One is that before 1977, that it was kind of tough to find science fiction films. I mean, we've talked a lot about different science fiction films on the show, you know, uh, Rollerball, so many of these things that were from the early 70s, Silent Running, all these movies, Dark Star, all these movies. So there were science fiction films, but they weren't necessarily as prevalent as they are today. It's not like we had the sci-fi channel in the early 70s. It wasn't like we had go out to your local multiplex and there's for sure going to be at least one science fiction film opening a week is how it feels like. There wasn't a video library. There wasn't a streaming library out there. So science fiction was 
tough to come by. And I think that this was one of those films that made such an impression on so many people because of when it was out, because of the world that it was building, because of the story that it was telling. And I will be perfectly honest and say that you have two very attractive people as your main characters, one especially, and I believe that Jenny Agutter really did a number on a lot of young men when it came to her role as Jessica Six. I think that she is probably one of the reasons why Logan's Run still is so popular today. I mean, between her turns in Walkabout and this film and An American Werewolf in London, she was kind of a sci-fi art film sex symbol for a lot of years and she's still sexy today she's still you know she was just in the second captain america movie and she's still working but yeah when she is in that barely amount of a dress that she's in in logan's run i think that put the zap on a lot of guys and probably opened up a lot of people's uh, sexuality right there when they saw jessica six Jenny Agatha. Oh, yes. Jenny Agatha is consistent. Jenny Agatha is like a brand name of screen nudity. Even in Logan's Run. For no reason at all. Walkabout. What a movie. Fantastic movie. Walkabout is the industry standard for frontal work. Can we just get back on the subject here, guys? I had a huge crush on her. Huge crush. That's the... I remember seeing Walkabout uh, after Logan's run and not realizing that that was her going into it. I was like, wow, yeah, I I get to see her naked now, you know, when you barely got a glimpse. And I felt really guilty because apparently she was like 15 when she did Walkabout. So, uh, but yeah, no, she she, and she still looks great. Yeah, she looks so I mean, she's making her appearance in in the Marvel movies. And she's a good actress. Eric, did you watch the TV series? I watched it when I was a kid. I try to refresh my mind by going on YouTube recently just to see what was up there. You have a lot of, you know, previews and stuff like that. I remember the series. I remember not being that too into it. It didn't really. I remember as a kid thinking, hmm, I'm not really into this. It's, it's, you know, it's okay. It was like one of those things where it's like when I was a kid, I, where I kind of, you mentioned something about how sci fi wasn't prevalent. Uh, up to 1976. I don't know if I agree with you on that. I recall there being a lot of sci-fi, but I also recall that it was the 70s where Star Trek really took off as a popular program, right, after it didn't do so well during the 60s in syndication. But you had Space 1999. You had a lot of television sci-fi that was popular, UFO, right? Um, and by the time Logan was run the TV series, I kept watching, I kept thinking, ah, oh, gee, there's better. There's better sci-fi shows like this on TV. Like, I love uh, Space 1999. Because it was dark. People died in that. And I love Star Trek, which, which seemed more intelligent and less, you know, uh, less dumbed down. Because you had certain tropes in the Logan's Run TV series that were basically ripoffs off of other stuff. Like uh, the, the Do- we talked about the Donald Moffat character. I think his character's name was Rem. He's just a variation on Spock, right? He keeps talking about what's logical and what isn't logical. You know, in almost every single episode, if I recall. But yeah, I remember watching it as a kid and thinking, yeah, yeah. Looking back on it, I could see why it was canceled very early. I rewatched a bunch of it for the show, and there were a couple episodes that stood out for me. There was one about a time traveler that was kind of interesting. It was this whole self fulfilling prophecy: he's a tra- time traveler from the past who's coming forward and trying to figure out what started the war and all this kind of stuff, only to find out later on that it was the invention of time travel that ends up causing the war. So it was kind of like a nice little uh, Twilight Zone esque kind of. Tw- twist to it in episodes like that it felt like logan and jessica and rem were just kind of fixtures there was really no playing into the actual world of logan's run there was one that i just watched the other day that was it was a whole like um uh like a ghost story and they're trying to bring back this guy's dead wife and all this kind of stuff and at the end of it i'm just like well that was okay but what the hell did that have to do with logan's run there was just nothing to do with anything and they didn't talk about sanctuary they didn't talk about francis coming after him any of that kind of stuff and it was just like yeah i don't really this was just it was like a script for something else that they just said change the names to logan jessica and rem 
and we're off to the races and there's nothing that had anything to do with anything else. I would have to agree with you as far as science fiction television, there was a good amount of that. And I was reminded at times while watching Logan's run, the television series of another series that I thought was better, which was the planet of the apes television series, which had a lot of tropes had that whole idea of like, let's uh, let the, one of the humans and one of the gorillas, they're trapped underground. They have to get to know each other. I mean, it was basically the elevator episode of so many different TV shows, comedy or drama. So we always get that kind of episode. And then at the end, they go back to hating each other, that kind of stuff. But it still it, it felt like a much stronger show to me than Logan's Run, and yeah, I kind of agree with you. I can see why it was canceled, even though they had some stellar writers on there. I mean, they had Harlan Ellison for an episode. They had some good directors. They had some talent. I like Gregory Harrison. I like Donald Moffat a lot. I had no idea Harlan Ellison wrote an episode. That's that's kind of cool. Yeah, they had some good talent on what, there. Did he really disown that episode? <laughs> I think he said that uh, somebody ripped him off for it, and he started suing people. Oh, wait, no, that's what he does for everything. I, f- I forgot. We better, we better watch out. The projection booth could get a summons pretty fast. Do you guys see, I mean, we've mentioned quite a few films so far, talking about things like THX 1138, 1984, Brave New World. Are there other uh, stories or films that we kind of see as similar to Logan's Run, things that have either taken from it or might have lent itself to Logan's Run? Well, for me, the only thing that seemed similar was in a movie that I watched recently, and it was about the outside world, the idea that those who are in charge don't want you to go outside, and that was Snowpiercer, which all takes place on the train, and everyone's been told that there's no more life outside of the train, and that the the train is this microcosm of society of whatever's left. That questioning of what's outside helps to lead to the rebellion in that one against, like I said, the figurehead or the, the main person that's running the whole show. But in this case, like I said, with Logan's run, uh, it was interesting that there was no, at least in the film, you said in the TV show, it changes a little bit in the books, uh, that there is no um, you know tribunal or head person that's running the show. It's just computers. I totally see the similarities in Snowpiercer. I think that's a good recent example. Um, I was going to ta- say mention The Island, the Michael Bay film, which in my mind is a ripoff of uh, Logan's run. Granted, all the characters are stuck in this sort of environment. It turns out that they're all clones and they're being controlled by this CEO who runs this business of, of creating clones so, so that their uh, innards can be harvested for his rich clients, right? Because they're all supposed to be match genetically the clients who are, you know, putting their money into this program. I think it's interesting. I, I just, this is sort of, I, this is the way my loopy head works. The movie's called The Island. It was made, it made in 2005, directed by Michael Bay, Logan's Run ripoff. Prior to that, a movie came out called The Island, directed by Danny Boyle, which is based on a novel by Alex Garland, who would go on to write the, judge, the recent Judge Dredd movie. Flash forward to very recently, they're talking about remaking Logan's Run and who's going to rewrite uh, write the remake of Logan's Run? Alex Garland. So I just found that a weird kind of like kind of synchronicity kind of like uh, connection. But yeah, the island to me is very, very almost too similar to Logan's run in so many ways. They're in a sort of situation. It's kind of like the Dome City where someone starts to question why we here. Everything seems idyllic and all that stuff. And there's another female that joins this person on his quest to find out what exists beyond the building. And it's sort of a very similar kind of hero's journey as as in Logan's run. I'm curious. I still haven't gone back and watched parts of the Clonus horror, a.k.a. Clonus. But I know that was, I think there was actually a lawsuit by the makers of that to the island. So it's almost like the island was a mashup of parts of the Clonus horror, which has that idea of the clones and being there for being harvested, mashing that up with the 
uh, the idea of the island and, and keeping these people separated and keeping them scared and in control, you know, kind of like what we were talking about right at the beginning of the conversation was this whole idea of why wouldn't they leave on their own? Why wouldn't society kind of break down naturally so that they are curious enough to go outside? And if memory serves with the island, they talk about how horrible it is outside the island and all this kind of stuff. And they're not actually even on an island at all. They're like under the desert kind of thing. But um, I, I got to go back one of these days and watch parts of Clonus Horror and see – if it compares at all to Logan's run or not, I just remember reading about it and just going, Oh, well that's, that's exactly what the Island is. But I do definitely see those overtones of Logan's run with the Island, especially the pretty young people and seeing Ewan McGregor and Scarlett Johansson basically being Logan five and Jessica six. That's, that's basically the first thing it's one. It's like, I have this sort of thing about Michael Bay. Like if I'm going to watch a Michael Bay movie, I'll only wait till it's on cable kind of thing. And so when the Island came on, I was like, I'll check it out, you know, and I'm watching this, I'm watching this, I'm watching this. Cause I've not seen a clone as horror, uh, but I'm watching, I'm like, wow, this is Logan's run. It's, it's definitely Logan's run. <laughs> it's, it's almost, it, I mean, there's a slightly different conceit to it. And you, you have, you know, a, a bad guy character who oversees everything, you know, Sean Bean. But other than that, it, it just has the same sort of story. Um, similar kind of characters. There's a conceit that, you know, they want to escape. Is there something outside of this world that they're in? Why should they be questioning that? And that's where I thought it was very similar to Logan's run. There's uh, also the movie In Time that came out a few years ago, which, again, very much like uh, young, pretty people. And that's kind of more the disparity of the haves and the have-nots. I guess that would fit more into the uh, Snowpiercer school. But I have to say, if folks want kind of a more humorous look at life in a dome city where people are afraid to go outside that they should look at the 1984 Polish film sex mission from uh, Julius Machulski. If I said his name, right, he's done a ton of great work, including this one. And it's kind of like a uh, sleeper where these two guys go into this experimental you know, hibernation program and they're awoken years and years later after the apocalypse and they are basically the last men on earth. The entire society is run by women and there's some great comedy, some good suspense to it. And what reminds me though the most of Logan's run is this whole idea of they keep being told how horrible it is on the outside of the dome and eventually one of these yahoos and one of the girls ends up leaving the city and finding out that the danger has passed a long time ago. So it, I definitely recommend this as a funny version of Logan's run. And don't ask me if it's on DVD in the United States because I'm not sure. Let's go ahead and take another break and play a preview for next week's show. There wasn't enough room in Toyland to escape the terror that rocked Baby's Cradle. I notice you call him Baby. And the case history doesn't show any other name. What is his real name? Just Baby. To Baby, life was not a giant playpen. It was a living hell. He wasn't allowed to walk. He wasn't allowed to talk. But he was capable of it. Baby is a full-grown man trapped by three women with no way out. Mama. Damn you. Oh, but you're not talking about that circus. Mm-hmm. They wanted to put him in a sideshow. We should have said yes. You're calling your brother a freak. Oh, Mama. I just thought it'd be better that way. Three. Oh. Close the door. I just wanted to face you one more time to tell you that you're sick. You're the one who needs help, not baby. That's just so much for you. You want him for yourself. Well, agency or no agency, you ain't gonna get him. This baby belongs to us. No, to me. He belongs to himself. 
He's not the subhuman thing you've made him. Scotia International Release, starring Angelette Comer, Ruth Roman, Mariana Hill, Suzanne Zenor, and David Manzi as Baby. Rated PG. <laughs> That's right. Next week, we're back with a discussion of not one, but two, and possibly even three movies about men acting like children. No, we're not talking about men just being men. We're talking about The Baby, Bad Boy Bubby, and The Milky Life. And, uh, you know... If you got them laying around, put on those diapers and get your nub nub handy. Now, before we go, I want to thank this week's special guest co host, Eric Cohen. Last time we talked to you, sir, was when we were talking William Friedkin's Sorcerer. What have you been up to lately? Still doing the Cinephiles. Uh, we have a bunch, of, a bunch of new episodes coming up. And we started a podcast about a month ago. And we're up to our fifth episode, which we just. Well, I don't know when this is going to air, this particular episode, but today's Sunday, March 15th. We just uh, uh, put up our, our fifth episode today, and that's still going strong. And I'm also contributing a lot as a writer to the website, thisisinfamous.com. I have an ongoing series called Lost and Found, where I try to encourage people to seek out films they may not have uh, heard of or would not have entered their radar, uh, films that were that they normally wouldn't give the light of day. Too. And so that's been a fun piece to write. What kind of stuff are you highlighting with your column? Um, the last piece I wrote about the 1929 silent film Pandora's Box, starring Louise Brooks, which I think is an amazing movie, needs to be seen. I also talked about The Burbs, the Joe Dante dark comedy, which I think is underrated and deserves a second look. Uh, plenty of stuff. The American Friend, the Vin Vendors movie, that was another thing I talked about. Uh, so it's, I try to vary it from like films that might seem commercial but somehow didn't get a chance to films that you've never heard of. Uh, there's, uh, there's some uh, Jodorowsky I'd like to get into, too, in the near future. So we'll see what happens with that. Jodorowsky? Is this a filmmaker I should be familiar with? But you'd be surprised how many people aren't. Well, thanks again, Eric. We'll have a link to where folks can uh, keep up with you over at our website, projection-booth.com. Be able to go over and hopefully subscribe to your podcast, listen to some episodes, catch you over on YouTube with all of the good stuff that you're doing, and check out the website as well. We want to thank everybody for listening. If you want to do us a solid, head on over to iTunes and give us a rating, give us a review, and please do so before your life clock stops ticking.
and identify.
enjoy this show and want more people to know about it head on over to itunes leave a comment and rate it five stars make sure you like and share us on facebook and don't forget to follow us on twitter just search for christopher media thank you in advance for supporting christopher media by clicking on the paypal button and by clicking through to all the sponsors who support christophermedia.net most importantly we would like to take the time to extend an extra special thanks to you christopher media could not exist without your support thank you for visiting christophermedia.net and thank you for listening Christopher Media, let's make some noise.